Okay, I just wanna confirm that we have uh, upgraded the two members who called in who are two board members. They are not yet showing as connected. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and we'll do the, we'll begin the roll call. Uh, well, let me call the meeting to order of the Wednesday, May 13th, 2020 regular governing board meeting. Um, this is a virtual meeting following the guidance of public health officials. The college has closed all of its facilities to the public and allows only restricted access to essential personnel to promote social distancing and limit the spread of the coronavirus. Accordingly, the governing board will conduct this meeting through remote technology only. Members of the general public are interested in following the proceedings can do so on our TV, on our YouTube, uh, and on through uh, my uh, board docs. Um, um, the meeting is called to order at 2.43 uh, uh, p.m. And our first order of business is our roll call. Uh, Mr. Sylvan, if you could read the, if you could call the roll, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Damian Quinto. Present. Mark Hanna. Present. Meredith Hay. Present. Maria Garcia. Maria Garcia. Uh, Luis Gonzalez. Mr. Chair, I think we still have two board members who have not yet connected to the meeting. Okay, um, let's just take a quick pause uh, and we'll just, you know, recess until we can get them um, connected. I want to thank everybody for bearing with us as we deal with a little technical challenge.
Hello. 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 Hello, Luis. Yes, sir. Hey, Luis. You made it. Hola, hola. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're still waiting for Maria. Yes. <laughs> okay, then. We'll wait. So, Damien, we have a quorum. Do you want to start or do you want to wait? I think let's, I mean, we could go ahead and wait. I know she's working on calling in now. So, um, so we'll go ahead and uh, reconvene the meeting. Um, our first item is our call to the audience. Uh, um, we only have one uh, member of the, we only have one member of the public who would like to speak, uh, which is uh, uh, Pima Community College uh, 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 instructor, Matei. Hello, greetings. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. So what I'm going to do, Matei, is we have the three-minute rule, as you know, and so what I'll do is I'll just let you know about 30 seconds before. All right. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to get through it quickly. Um, good afternoon, everybody, board members, uh, Chair Klinko, and colleagues. Uh, my name is Matei Vogelschak. I'm president of PCCA. I wish you all good health, spirits, as we approach the end of a wild academic year. Um, a huge thank you is in order for all the heavy lifting the faculty have done over the last couple of months to help our students finish, almost there. And we are equally thankful for all the hard work and creative efforts of our college staff and administrators who are really balancing enormous logistical and financial challenges. All of us at the college are urgently focused on supporting our students through this time, and we are excited to celebrate their success at graduation next week. Um, the way everybody has stepped up and pulled together for a single purpose uh, really makes us proud to be part of Pima. Um, <clears throat> PCC greatly appreciates the Chancellor's leadership during this difficult period and his focus on students and employees. We have been encouraged by his recent message recognizing the importance of face-to-face -face education in the long run beyond this crisis and challenges faced by online students. We are pleased the Provost has committed to a transparent data-informed process for prioritizing faculty positions with key input from uh, academic division leadership, and we're expecting a follow-up. Um, the faculty are eager to work together with the administration to gear up for the fall semester, get things done, help our students address the, their critical needs, and really those inequities that have been so exposed in, in such an ugly way um, in, this, in this situation. Uh, while we examine opportunities to successfully position our college for the future, which we must do, we join our chancellor and provost in affirming that long-term systemic restructuring beyond just next fall should wait until all stakeholders are fully able to focus on it and participate in the planning process. And that will ensure that informed decisions are made that support student learning, enrollment, and the college mission. So now, as you consider the proposed fiscal year 21 budget, uh, PCCA respectfully urges you to review it carefully and ask detailed questions. Please consider what is really important and request changes as you see them as appropriate. Um, last spring, I shared major concerns about trends in our expenditures, how our public money is spent, and whom the college values and doesn't by extension. Um, and I hate to spoil the warm feeling, uh, feelings of unity, uh, but these concerns have only intensified recently, and somebody has to put them on the table. Um, so spending on faculty is way down, shrinking in both absolute terms and as a share of the overall budget. And that's not just because we haven't gotten steps as a group in seven years, but uh, not just because the counselors are being uh, losing their faculty status that might be part of it, uh, but positions and disciplines that really- yeah, you have about 30 seconds left. Thank you. Positions and disciplines that really need them are now being closed and uh, salary lines repurposed um, to uh, fund other instructional priorities that require their own dedicated funding source in the budget, like the Teaching and Learning Center, Pima Online. It cannot be either or, we really need both. Um, at the same time, the Chancellor is asking for a $300,000 increase over 5% for administration 
administrative personnel next year. Why? Uh, for this uh, year ending June 30th, our CFO got a step, our acting chief HR officer got a step, a couple of other executive administrators got multiple steps as their jobs got reorganized, and plenty of other steps um, uh, were awarded the year before that to um, uh, uh, administrative personnel. Uh, previously, top level administrative positions with baffling titles were created, some of them seemingly for individuals without a competitive process. We have 45 assorted directors who aren't technically administrators, but make an average of 92,000 a year. The chancellor himself got an enormous compensation increase hidden away into unbelievable perks. Um, even though benchmarking okay, two years ago- you hit the time limit. So we, right, really appreciate, we really appreciate your time. Um, again, you know, if you if you, you are always as as always, please you know send the full comments to the board for us to review. Um, we really appreciate your input um, to anyone listening and to the greater community. We've we've set up a practice now um, while we have these virtual meetings of allowing the uh, the traditional call to the public, um, and anybody can participate. You just need to submit uh, your contact information. Um, by noon the day of the meeting. So Matei, we really appreciate uh, your input and um, please be safe. And again, thank you for everything you are doing for the college. Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda is uh, the uh, remarks by the governing board. Um, I, uh, I will keep mine very brief, um, but I wanna echo uh, Matei's comment um, just to thank everybody lift that they're doing. This has been an extraordinarily harrowing period of time. Uh, um, I, I, I and this entire board um, fully understand the uh, tremendous effort that each and every single member that our students can be successful, that they can complete the year, uh, and that we can get ready to continue delivering uh, the educational opportunities this summer and into the fall. Uh, so I, I, I'm personally extraordinarily appreciative. Um, so thank you for the incredible work that each and every uh, member of this college community is doing. Um, Mr. Hanna. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Klingo. Uh, so yes, thank you to everyone. Some of the people on the screen right now are the real stars and, and actually everyone, our faculty, our staff, administrators, we're real stars and really stepped up and, and uh, uh, for those of you who are online for the all college meeting we had last week, uh, you could just see in the comments section, people really embracing this opportunity to work together to make our college uh, successful. And a special shout out to Norma and all her folks who got those checks out to, so I, it appears that we may have been the first college in the entire state to get the uh, checks from the CARES Act directly into our students' hands. And that's just an amazing effort. Thanks to good planning and execution, uh, I'm, I'm certainly grateful for that. And then uh, I just wanna quickly take a moment to recognize an educator who we lost this week, a person very uh, close to my own uh, um, uh, route into education. This is Marge Christensen Gould, who was a teacher at uh, Catalina High School. She taught at-risk students. She had a program specifically for them uh, to teach them literacy skills and job uh, interview skills. Uh, I met her 20 years ago. She invited, I was searching for a second career. She invited me into the classroom. She taught me that students and all of us who are have anything to do as educators know this, that students all learn differently and find the key to that learning ability is how you make a student successful. So I'm very grateful to her and I, I'm saddened by the by her passing this week. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hanner. Dr. Hay. Yeah, I wanna echo certainly uh, Chairman Klinko what you said about uh, thanking um, all the faculty, the staff, um, the leaders, administrative leaders, it's just done heroic work, but also thanking the students for completing their coursework, sticking with us um, and coming back, re-enrolling this summer and this fall, and that we're all in this together. And it's just been an extraordinary work of, of teamwork and effort. And, and it just fills me with hope that we'll get through this 
and I want to thank everybody for their contributions. Thank you very much, Dr. Hay. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez? I believe you're on mute. Mr. Gonzalez? Yes. Um, <laughs> we can hear the you third now. Time I'm, re I'm here. <laughs> I just want to say uh, that thanks to the faculty, thanks to PCC in reference to uh, the challenging times that we have right now, but I think we're, as a team, we'll, we'll go through this and we'll continue on with uh, striving what we need to do for the betterment of our students. But I do do think that we can um, have different approaches, but more important, acknowledge the students that will be graduating next week that, uh, that did complete, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's gonna be a great, great for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. Well, I would like to thank everyone that has taken the time to participate in this web-based board meeting. I want to extend my most sincere thanks to all faculty leadership and support staff for their dedication and contribution to the students and to this institution. I understand how difficult it must be for everyone during these very trying times. Pima College must continue to provide a quality, affordable education to its residents. Without your contributions and dedication to this college and honoring your own profession, this would not be possible. To the 2020 Pima College graduates, congratulations. Your efforts and perseverance have paid off. I want to leave you with a quote from Ricky Rogers. Strength doesn't come from what you can do. It comes from overcoming the things you once thought you couldn't do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia. Um, next, we have our administrative reports. Um, we're gonna begin with Brooke Anderson, our uh, faculty representative. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, administrative reports are not the, <laughs> is not our reports from our, uh, our representatives of the board. Uh, Chancellor Lambert, uh, if you wanna go ahead and begin with the, uh, the first. Uh, yes, uh, so, uh, now we've had uh, folks working on a response and recovery plan and Tom Davis has been leading that effort for the college. So I asked that Tom uh, share with you what that plan is starting to shape up to look like. Tom? Hi, right, good, good afternoon. Board Chair Klinko, members of the governing board, Chancellor Lambert, fellow employees, friends of Pima, I'm Tom Davis, Chief of Staff of the College. It's an honor to be with you here again. Um, during the past two board meetings, I have outlined our plans for a worst case scenario to shut down the college and the most likely scenario to move to online instruction. Today, I'll discuss our reentry planning efforts. But first, I must say that over the last few months that we have dealt with this crisis, our employees and students have adapted brilliantly. And frankly, they have gone above and beyond what was expected. But Chancellor, myself, and the entire leadership, executive leadership team are beyond grateful for the selfless service of our employees and how they have adapted to assist our students in this transitioning to this new environment. As you have seen in the news, there is mounting pressure from various entities around the United States, the state of Arizona, even here in Tucson to reopen our communities. From my lens, the data does not indicate that we are there yet, especially here locally in Tucson. What we are doing is, is the prudent planning on how we will re-enter the workspace. Today, I'll outline the framework and discuss a few potential topics that you may have questions on. And then and now our basis, basic premise in our planning efforts is to do, do minimum harm to our students while balancing their as well as our employees' safety and security. Additionally, as outlined in the previous discussions, the need to be as flexible as possible continues to be paramount. As we have all seen and experienced, the situation can change daily, if not hourly. None of that has changed. As I've done previously, I wanna lay out the reality of our situation. As you are probably aware, as of today, there are approximately 4.3 million cases worldwide. There were 925 last time we talked, 1,000. Um, with approximately 294,000 deaths, again, 46,000 deaths last time. Here in the United States, there are approximately 1.4 million cases uh, compared to 210,000 last time. I have to point out that's 1 million cases more than the next closest country. We have almost 84,000 reported deaths, 
Um, here in Arizona, there are just over 12,000 reported cases with 594 reported deaths. Uh, 1,623 of those cases are here in Pima County with 136 reported deaths. There are 29 deaths last time in Pima County. The majority of those cases and deaths have happened since the last time I talked to you six weeks ago. These statistics make it more imperative that we continue to take this seriously since we have the highest fatality rate in the state at, at this point. Again, my point to you is that this is still a very real threat. It is here and we as a college are continuously, continually taking this seriously. But Chancellor has been and continues to be very clear in his guidance. The safety of our students, employees, and community comes first. With that said, we have developed a six-phase plan um, to uh, re-enter our workspace. Again, at the appropriate time. I will point out that even though these phases are sequential, um, they may be and in fact do run concurrently as conditions merit and or as leaders direct um, in order to advance timelines. Currently, we're in phase zero, one, and two. So I'll describe the phases. Phase zero, planning, coordination, and training. In this phase, individual units are creating unit reentry plans specific to the workplace. The plan that I've described is the umbrella overarching plan. Um, they will also coordinate their plans with other units and with uh, the district to ensure synchronization of effort and potentially any external um, and potentially coordinating with external entities. Additionally, while this is happening, units will start to ensure that they have gone or they have enough uh, PPE or uh, personal protective equipment, such as masks, gloves, uh, potentially eye protection and or coveralls, um, depending on, on their workspaces um, for their employees. Individual employees will be trained in the fitting, wearing and use of PPE, as well as safe removal, sanitizing and disposal prior to reentering their workplaces. That's phase zero. Phase one, essential employees returning to the workplace. Throughout the COVID-19 situation, essential employees like the police, Police officers, uh, payroll personnel, facilities workers have been allowed to conduct mission essential tasks in order to keep the vital functions of the college operational. We will continue to allow mission essential person or personnel to re-enter the workplace on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, utilizing protocols established by our facilities team um, and police team. This phase is ongoing. Phase two, the advanced group. This phase begins with unit and departmental advanced teams being identified and subsequently returning to workspaces to evaluate, evaluate them and ultimately potentially and potentially con reconfiguring them to be able to accept um, employees within the um, social distancing parameters. This phase may take a long period of time due to potential reconfiguration. Um, alternative protocols could be in place to limit uh, employees contact like shift work or alternative schedules or locations. Ultimately, the advanced group will make recommendations to unit leadership on a plan to ensure employees operate within those social distancing recommendations um, through alternative scheduling, et cetera. Uh, but it's not just the workplaces, it's the classrooms that are being evaluated and reconfigured as well. Instructors are looking at the best hands-on instruction that are required, um, especially in our CT and various required lab-related courses um, in phase three. From looking at ways to more efficiently schedule to in placing barriers um, in order to protect students and faculty um, to actual reconfiguration or expansion of spaces to accommodate backlog of students that we were not able to uh, finish in, in the spring. So uh, now we go on to phase three, the reentry of for employees needed to fulfill career and technical education labs and necessary face to face um, operational pieces. After unit advanced teams identify and reconfigure their workspaces for reentry, and only when deemed necessary for safe operations will students and employees be allowed to conduct limited face-to-face -face operations or instructions in critical CTE labs and other hands-on areas. The maximum use of technology and virtual learning must be utilized prior to any employee or student entering instructional areas or uh, for any required hands-on learning. Social distancing recommend recommendations will still be mandated uh, during that time frame. And then uh, phase four is the additional employees returning minus employees needing and or required to still work from home. As conditions allow and as social distancing restrictions are more relaxed, the college leadership um, and the college leadership determines it's safe. The number of employees returning to work will be gradually increased and allowed back into the workplace. There will be groups of employees that will need and or still be required to work from home. 
the college had made a commitment through the end of the fiscal year to allow employees with specific circumstances that were beyond their control to work from home without consequence. Examples of those employee groups um, uh, are like uh, employees that have children in, in K-12 because the schools are closed, um, or other employees caring for family members who are sick, employees with pre-existing conditions, um, and the like. And then uh, phase five. Uh, all employees operating from their designated workspace and the return to large community events. In essence, phase five is the resumption of normal workplace activities and the reintegration of PC back into the local community. Community events can take place with large, with large gatherings. It is anticipated that this may be some time before this will occur, though. There is obviously concern of a, that a second wave of COVID-19 virus may precede this phase. In essence, we could go back to phase one level activities, even though we may be in phase four. Um, again, um, that's something we, we are taking into consideration within our, our planning aspect. But the, to, so you know the status of the plan, the unit leadership um, are working with their teams to develop, coordinate, and synchronize their individual plans. That work should be completed in the coming week or so. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, we are concurrently working in phase zero, one, and two. Not only are we planning, unit leadership has pushed forward their advanced teams and are accessing their spaces uh, to look not only at individual workspaces, but at classrooms, like I mentioned. Um, so they're going to look at how and what modality is optimal for each classroom, as well as what potential barriers could be in place to protect students and faculty. With the assistance of our healthcare deans, uh, our facilities personnel and campuses, um, we are setting in place appropriate protocols, processes, and processes to ensure students and employees are monitored uh, prior to entry into facilities during phase three using single en entry and exit point model. One of the larger questions um, that employees have been asking, and, uh, and I'm sure you're, uh, you're wondering, is um, when will we return to the workplace? That is currently unknown. Currently, we're not going to put out a, a specific date or even be held to a specific date because of the conditions I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, our decision um, matrix will be based on, on conditions. Um, but to, to put it out there, most employees should plan on working remotely through the end of the calendar year. We do not anticipate employees coming back in mass anytime soon. That they will continue to work remotely or on a rotating schedule if we do happen to go into phase three or four, where um, only part of an office staff may be back in the office spaces. Some staff though, like facilities and our police department will have probably a normal schedule in their workplaces. Um, so the decision to return employees to student and students to the campuses beginning in phase three will, will be made by the chancellor and the board chair. First and foremost, the basis of any decision will be made will be the safety and security of our students and employees. The chancellor and, and uh, the board chair will use current data and potential recommendations from the Pima County Health Department in order to determine the current and forecasted COVID-19 trends and outlook. They will look at guidance from the governor office. They will look at recommendations from the ELT and in consult consultation with Pima County leadership as well as the city of Tucson leadership. We're also gonna look at the community and how it is responding to the businesses return to work, as well as the university, what the University of Arizona is doing and how they are approaching the reopening. We've already been in discussions with them um, at the highest levels and plan to keep an open dialogue and uh, to consult regularly with each other um, to share our, each other's plans. Um, another question is, will we test our student or uh, employees and students? At this point, no. Though we would prefer to test everyone prior to resuming classes, that is currently not an option. There is not, physically not enough tests in the county to accommodate that. And what tests are available in the local area reserved for COVID-19 symptomatic uh, individuals. So because of that, and the prevalent protocol of test, track, and treat, it's not necessarily an option for us. But we, what we will be able to do, if a student or employee does become symptomatic, uh, we will refer them to local healthcare professions to then be tested, tracked, and treated um, if required. Um, if the availability of testing increases, then we, of course, will relook this. But according to Pima County, testing for all our employees and students is just not an option at this time. Will we continue to social distance? Yes. Uh, we will follow the social distancing recommendations. As you may have seen, the county recently announced relaxed guidelines, um, which we will uh, extend into our workplaces and classrooms. They still have individuals wearing masks in public, 
um, but with groups of 10 being able to gather. And if more than one group of 10 is nearby, they must be separated by, by six feet with restaurants being able to go to 50% capacity in, with, with those modes. We will translate that into our classrooms. Um, and I believe Dolores has, has created a planning number of 15 plus or minus depending on the actual size of the classroom. Um, uh, Dolores is available discussing the academic plans if you have any specific questions. Lastly, as you're aware, a comprehensive deep cleaning has taken place, not only disinfecting all common areas in our, um, in our facilities, but major maintenance and cleaning of our systems that had not been conducted in de decades. Obviously, employees will be expected to clean their personal areas regularly, as well as wash their hands more frequently following CDC recommendations. Facilities and custodial staff have begun planning to clean high traffic areas several times a day as we return to normal operations. So pending any of your questions, um, that's all I have for you. Um, back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Tom. Does any of the members of the board have um, any specific questions about the phased plan? I don't hear any, just to be nope. clear. Okay, next, we're, uh, thank you, Tom. We really appreciate uh, the detail. And again, we appreciate the you know, very methodical and um, conservative approach that really prioritizes the safety of our faculty, our staff, and uh, of course our students, so thank you. Thank um, you. Next, we have our enrollment update, uh, distribution of the CARES Act funds with David Ariano, our Dean of Enrollment Management and Norma Navarro, Castellanos, the Executive Director for Financial Aid and Scholarship. Thank you, Damien. So good afternoon, Chairperson of the Board, Board members, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. Um, my name is David Adiano. I'm going to begin with introducing our Executive Director of Financial Aid, Norma Navarro Castellanos, who's going to share some information on the CARES Act. And while she's queuing up, I'm going to share our PowerPoint or our slide deck with you all so you can follow along as we give you the update. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And also thank you everybody for the opportunity to be able to speak to you as to the timeline and the steps that we took to be able to uh, distribute these funds to students. But I do not want to miss the fact that it took this village that you see here, all the names of these individuals to make sure to help us get this executed for our students. Um, this is just another example, another glimmering, shining light of the capabilities that we have here at, at Pima College. Um, the community that we have and being able to come together to make sure we deliver um, the needs of our students. Um, so I'd like to begin, um, if you don't mind going to the next um, slide, thank you. The Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, known as the CARES Act, was signed into law on March 27th. Pima College received um, its letter from Secretary Claus on April 9th. The following day, on April 10th, Pima College was submitted the certification and agreement form in order to accept these funds. And on April 20th, Pima College received its first allocation of funds. The first allocation of funds was $4,994,525. This is known as the student portion. Um, this portion of funds have to be, had to be directly distributed to students. By April 23rd, we did our very first distribution to students. Our first 881 students received funds. And we have been doing so every week since then. As of today, I would like to say, I, I'm very proud to say that we have over 6,000 students that have and will be receiving these funds. This week is in process and these students will be receiving, this week's uh, distribution of students is 300 students. So in total, we have 6,079 students that have received these CARES funds, placing us at more than $4.8 million being distributed to students um, for this spring semester. The focus though now 
is to assist students that we have received a FAFSA application or have not yet received a FAFSA application for the 2019-20 school year. Pima College typically receives nearly 18,000 FAFSA applications per year. A good amount of those applications, students are selected for a process known as verification or other pieces of information that we are required to verify, confirm for students. We average on a yearly basis about half of those students not completing those, those steps. And it's no more apparent today now the need. Students are stepping forward indicating they are in need of these emergency funds, but we need to make sure that they have completed the steps in order to receive federal student aid as well. This was also apparent as students were submitting um, applications for the Pima Emergency Fund. And the team to get, that was put together to evaluate students that were submitting those applications also saw that students had, must, many of these students had submitted a FAFSA application, but that had outstanding requirements. So this team led by Edgardo has committed, Edgardo Cornejo is committed to working with students to making sure they complete the, the next steps because these students could be able to receive Title IV federal student aid in addition to emergency funding. So that is our focus now. Pima has also received its second allocation, an additional $4,994,524. Again, a very quick turnaround. We submitted our certification and agreement on April 23rd, and then by May 6, we received our notification of disbursement from the Department of Education. From this second allocation, 2.5 million is going to be utilized for the purchase of laptops to be able to offer for students to help them get through their education this summer and in the fall. One and a half million will be reserved as well to be able to continue distributing funds for these students. There is a subgroup of students that will be specifically identified. These are students that had to, that were unable to complete their coursework this spring semester simply because of the way their programs are designed. We have a lot of programs, as you're well aware, that have a lot of didactive, a lot of hands-on work. And these students, many of them were unable to finish this spring semester, so they were being given incompletes or I grades. These students will be coming back are expected to come back this summer, fall, or even up to the spring semester to finish this course, coursework. These are this next allocation of funds. We will be targeting those students to make sure they receive this additional funding because even though these students will not be billed tuition and fees to finish the coursework that they left pending, they will have expenses related to their cost of attendance, such as material supplies, travel expenses. So they will need that extra help there. There is a remaining 994,524 from this second allocation that we will be considering for any additional resources. And those can be hotspots or other information technology, equipment, software to enable students to participate in distance learning as a result of this significant change to the delivery of instruction due to the coronavirus. So lastly, I'd like to speak about the third allocation here. The third allocation is due to our Hispanic serving institution um, status. We're a minority serving institution and we also received our notice from the sec from Secretary DeVos on April 30th. The amount for this is $640,229. However, there's a slight variance to this third pot of money that it comes with the ability to be able to complete or create an application designated by us in which the student can attest under the penalty of perjury to meet the requirements of section 484 of the HEA, meaning it provides a little bit more flexibility than us needing to have the FAFSA application and looking at the data elements that we have had to look at during this first and second allocation that we've received. And so we are considering developing the certification form so that students may be able to submit this to us. So in total, Pima College 
will be receiving $10,629,278 due to the CARES Act. That's my update in regards to the CARES funds. If anybody has any questions for me. Does any member of the board have questions? Mr. Klinko? Uh, yes, Ms. Hanna. Yeah, so um, Norman, thank you again. I, I just can't thank you and all, all the folks and David, everybody involved in this. Uh, I, I even spoke to several students personally who were just so grateful that they had received their checks and told me that it made a huge difference and uh, the fact that you got them out so quickly. But uh, I, I think that what this all points to is, as we get through all this is that we have to, whatever we have to do to get students to complete the FAFSA because it, uh, I think it just really points out that even without this whole thing, we have students who could have been receiving federal aid prior to this whole thing. They probably aren't because they never completed the FAFSA. So we need to, to really focus in on that if we can once yeah. we're done with all this. Definitely. This week's batch of 300 is a testament to that um, because otherwise they would have been selected in the, th the weeks prior to, to for us to distribute the CARES funds. And from last week to this week, that was the amount of effort that we put in to make sure students not only are just submitting their FAFSA application, but being able to complete, submit all the, the, the necessary documents that were required to verify. Norma, could you tell me for students who withdrew or have an incomplete prior to uh, the issuance of the CARES funds, uh, mm -hmm. are, are they eligible for this funding if they reach out to the college? If they are completely withdrawn from the institution, I'm not able to distribute these funds to those students um, for this spring semester. Um, however, the students that had to receive all incompletes in all of their coursework, um, they're, upon their return to finish their coursework, these students will be re-enrolling in those same courses, will not be billed um, for that course again. But again, that is the student population that I am focusing on for this second allocation um, because these students will have those additional expenses. Um, the CARES Act did come with some provisions in regulatory. And so students who had to completely withdraw from the institution uh, normally under normal circumstances, we have to calculate the unearned aid and bill back the student. Um, due to this CARES Act, that is not something that is occurring at this time. And additionally, we have also built into, at the end of the semester, every time we evaluate students' academic progress, students who have an I, um, will, the I grade will not count in the quantitative measure of academic progress. Any other Mara, did I understand you to say that if a student withdrew and had been see, receiving financial aid, that it's we are obligated to contact them and have them pay back financially? Under, under normal circumstances. But because of our circumstances right now, the CARES Act brought with it also provisional regulation. And part of that, one of those regulations is that students who have completely withdrawn, we will not be billing them the unearned aid. Um, so students normally, when they stop out in a semester and completely withdraw, we have to calculate what they did not earn from that day in which they completely withdrew from the institution to the end of the term. Right. Normally that is billed back. Under CARES Act, this provision is in effect that we will not, we are not billing students back. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Norma, can yes. you share, I, I know that uh, the college has already identified the technology pieces under the second allocation. Could you just briefly share that? Yes, there are several laptops that um, will be purchased, that have been purchased to be able to distribute to students. Um, let me bring that up for you. So that will be, going into effect very shortly. The purchase is underway. 
and being able to distribute these laptops to students starting the summer. Um, it's on a lending basis so that students will be able to finish their courses for this summer and then as well for fall semester. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there additional questions from them from any members of the board? Okay, Norma, thank you very much again. Just to echo Mark's comments, we really appreciate the tremendous lift to get this funding out the door and thank into the hands of our students under these uh, extraordinary circumstances. So thank you. Um, next, we have our marketing update with Lipsa Brodsky, our Vice Chancellor for External Relations. Damien, I had a, a small update to provide oh, as I think David well. was okay. right. Sure, go I'm ahead, sorry, David. David, go ahead. I apologize, thank you, Damien. Um, and so, Again, I'm appreciative and I think we're really proud of all the work that folks have done on the CARES Act and emergency funding, um, that all the work that they've done. Um, we're appreciative of the guidance from our ex executive leadership team as well. Um, what I wanna talk about really quickly is um, a lot of the things we've done to transition our student services, our student affairs to that virtual realm so we can continue to support students during this time. And so when we look at the student affairs virtual transition, we went from a campus-based structure to really a team-based approach in helping support our students, um, really focused on retention and that student support piece. And so we've created a multi-channel approach for students to engage uh, academic advisors and the services that they need from, from student affairs. Um, we, we really focused on how do we get students to stay enrolled. And a lot of this interacts with the CARES funding, emergency funding, uh, Wi-Fi parking lot access, um, Wi-Fi in the, in the parking lots, uh, technology and laptop loanings. It, it's, it's really a complex uh, event where we bring in multiple pieces to make sure that that student can stay engaged. Um, and again, our, the work from our program advisors, counselors, enrollment advisors, liaison, student life, virtual financial aid, and, and, and so on, has really been focused on that academic and personal support, really caring about the student, listening to the student, expressing empathy, uh, making sure that we can refer students out to the appropriate resources. There's so many resources out there to help support students, whether it's health-wise, safety, or, or financially, and then making sure we can keep advising them to make the right decisions as they navigate um, finishing up this semester. We've provided a, a lot of guidance on the withdrawal and incomplete processes. We've built in a lot of provisions as a college that, I, that are really cutting edge and, and not seen uh, a lot across, across the nation in terms of um, executive leadership's decision to offer tuition credits or waivers for withdrawals and for the incompletes. That, that's really uh, at the forefront. A lot of schools are not doing that. And that, that's really going to be a key piece in retaining our students and getting some new enrollments for the fall. Um, huge group working on those emergency funds, really triaging students to make sure they were, they were sent to the right location. Um, and then another piece that, that we don't usually talk about is the Access and Disability Resources Office. So we really had to pivot to make sure that those accommodations that existed in the face-to-face -face realm, that they could easily translate into the new, the new virtual realm or the online realm. And that's a huge student support piece, student success retention piece. And the ADR team has been really successful in making sure that, that we can continue to support our students uh, in, that, in that realm or with those accommodations. Looking forward, though, we have a huge task in front of us in terms of our summer enrollment and our fall enrollment. Um, when we look at that, we've, from the get-go in early March, started looking at how we can make sure we can guide students, new students, through the enrollment funnel. We've working, we're working with a case list of over 3,000 students that have applied since late February, making sure that they're going through each step, getting them registration ready. We have 20 enrollment advisors working with those students continuously. Um, I talked about the ADR component, but also as students transition out and realize in these new modalities, they may need accommodations. Uh, we're reaching out early now to make sure that we can provide them so that that transition into those modalities is really seamless for them and they can be successful. Um, last month, we mentioned the admissions application 2.0 that is up and live, no issues on our front end. Uh, we've presented that out to staff and we've seen students continue to apply to the institution at around 70 or 80 applications per day 
since we went live with that. Um, one of the other highlights we'll, we'll be bringing out is a chatbot expansion. So Norma and the financial, financial aid team pioneered the chatbot uh, last fall, got great results, have a, have a lot of uh, virtual resources for students and, and really making sure that students has, have that access to financial aid information 24 seven. We'll be expanding that out to veteran services, student accounts, registrar office, and student services. So this will be an additional resource on top of our, our phone lines, our email channels, our, our Google Hangouts. Uh, this chatbot will be a, a new addition. And then I wanted to provide a, 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 an update on Pearson. Pearson, um, a lot of great work still going on there. Um, even with the challenges um, with the employers that we work through the Pearson partnership, those employers are in the hospitality and tourism industry. And we know those have really taken a hit during this pandemic, um, but we're still seeing some steady enrollments from those students. Um, and we're roughly for the summer, we should have around 300 Pearson students enrolled at Pima. And so I wanted to provide as we look forward, as, as and, and what we're doing in the now to support students is, is really about the health and safety, the support and making sure that we retain them, we enroll them and, and move them forward, even during these, these um, troubling times. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions the board may have. Are there any questions for David? I just want to say thank you, David, for the application that uh, I've heard good things already. So thank you. Long time coming. Thank you for all the work you put into it and your team. Thank you, Mark. Dr. Hay? Good job, David. No, I just want to say thank, thank you, David, for your good job. Thank you, board. OK, anybody else? Yep, David, thank you. We really appreciate it. We know this, again, has been a massive lift and a unusual time to bring it online, but I think the timing in some ways could not have been better now that we have these major tools aligning to be able to support students and more cohesively in a online environment. So thank, thank you, you so much. And that brings us to our next report, which is uh, our marketing update from Lisa Brodsky, Vice Chancellor uh, for External Relations. Um, and if you haven't had an opportunity to take a look at the new website, um, it really is uh, an extraordinary improvement to um, the tool we had before. Ms. Brodsky, you are up. All right, very good. Thank you very much, Chairman Klinko, members of the board, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. So I'm gonna give you a very high level overview of what we're doing in marketing. Um, I'm hoping you can see my screen, yes. <laughs> Pushing all the right buttons. So um, marketing right now for everybody is certainly difficult. You know, Finding your voice, finding your space is really tough. And it's especially difficult in higher education right now. We've seen the headlines. We certainly don't want these headlines to be repeated for Pima. Um, but the reason marketing is, is difficult is certainly given the situation that we're in. Um, you know, families are dealing with a lot right now at home. Um, people are looking to get through programs quickly to get to their next step. Um, we're hearing about a growing interest in a gap, students taking a gap year um, to, to get past some of this. And you know, even though everybody is giving a thousand percent, you know, customer service uh, is, is challenged right now uh, by our virtual environments. The good news is, and there's lots of good news, is that Pima has a lot of opportunities. So as you know well, we have a high quality Pima online program that we're really taking advantage of this year. Being local and local institution is gonna be important for more reasons than usual. Of course, our low tuition. Um, in, our, in the next presentation from Dr. Rohr, you're gonna hear a lot about some short-term training opportunities and skills programs that we're really going to be able to market and take advantage of. And then we also believe that students are really going to like um, having more eight week options. And we think they're going to like the hybrid courses. And I'll talk to you about why that is. Um, so first, I want to let you know that student recruiting is also doing very well. They're very active. Um, they are meeting regularly with counselors. A lot of classes have invited them into their Zoom presentations. And these guys are reaching out with every tool they have. I think there's even been some conversations across a street from time to time. Um, we're working to partner this time of year. We tend to do a lot of coaching on, on working through, helping students work through the application. Um, again, you know, I was gonna say the good news is that our new application is easing the need to do that, but we're still looking for those opportunities. This is also a time when we would talk to them about students about FAFSA as well. So we're looking for some partnership opportunities so we can provide that hands-on support. 
Um, our social media also is doing very well. You know, these are the tools that we have to really show people inside the institution to show that we are active and alive and well. And, you know, the good news is our likes are up, our engagements are up. So we're really happy to see that. Um, we were able to take advantage this year of um, Nurses Celebration Month, which is all May. Um, we have these billboards all over town. Um, we included some radio in support of this. And so we were really happy to be able to let those frontline workers know how much we appreciate them and that uh, we're happy to be part of their community. So significantly regarding advertising, um, we, right now, this camp, our Pima Online campaign started about three weeks ago. We're working with Staymates on this campaign. This is a very aggressive digital effort that is targeting four of our Pima Online programs. And what's fun about this campaign, what's going to be interesting, um, is a lot of the a lot of the tools that we have now that we didn't have before. So with our new website, we were able to create dedicated landing pages. We also created a customized phone number and email addresses. What this means is that we are able to track when people hit one of our ads, if they hit our website, how long they spend there, if they complete our RFI form, if they complete the, um, the if they call that number, if they submit an email, we can follow them hopefully all the way through to enrollment, um, but it also allows us to adjust the messages on the fly. So if, if something isn't working, if the message we have out there don't seem to be attracting a lot of attention, we can adjust the language, we can adjust the ad and increase that response rate. Another cool thing that we're doing with this campaign, normally we would geofence the high school. So while the students were in school, they'd actually be served up ads on their phones. Obviously we can't do that right now, but we can do it in a manner of speaking because we're able to target these high schools, we're able to detect if their devices had been in that school. And so we will serve up at these advertisements on those devices. So we're still able to reach those high school students very effectively with this campaign. Um, you're gonna hear a little bit more from Dr. Rourke on this Google IT certificate program. We did a very short campaign for this in April, got tremendous response to the ad. Um, we have, I think we have at least eight, last number I heard, probably more by now, students enrolled in this. As we identify funding, we believe this was another opportunity um, that we, this is another opportunity that we would really like to market rather heavily actually. Um, our general enrollment campaign is currently up and running. So I'm, I'm hoping that you've seen it. Um, we're, we have every element, we have outdoor, TV, radio, um, certainly digital and social. Um, with this campaign, you know, we spent a lot of time discussing what the message for it could be. And what we ultimately settled on um, was that, that um, to stand out from um, the other messaging that is going on right now, we really need to give people something direct, something actionable, something that spoke to their future and how they could advance their lives from where it is right now, especially people who have been really severely affected by this coronavirus. And so we offer a very direct message about enrolling and letting people know that Pima is there for them. We're active, we're ready for you and, and classes are gonna start uh, this summer and certainly this fall. Um, we're gonna follow closely on the heels. Actually, part of this is already launched, it launched today um, with some more directed messages. So this is where being local and uh, reaching our universities is gonna be critical. So our summer campaign um, is, what we've usually typically done with our summer campaign is, is geofence the universities and encourage students to come to Pima. We're doing that in the same way I mentioned before, where this time we're able to kind of uh, target their .edu email addresses and they're getting these digital ads on their devices that way. But we really want them to understand about the fact that they can save money, that the classes transfer. We think they like, will like the eight week uh, programs and the hybrid courses where they have an opportunity to be on class, but also um, be in a safe virtual environment. What we really hope resonates with a lot of these students, especially the ones that might have been inclined to sit out a year or those who um, wanted to go out of state but may sit out because they're um, concerned about going out of state, is that they can come to Pima and continue their education seamlessly. They don't have to take a gap year that they may not have wanted to take or had planned to take, that we have opportunities for them. And we're hearing increasingly that uh, both locally and nationally, you know, students are saying, well, if I'm gonna be in a virtual classroom, I'm not gonna pay university prices for it. We know we have a very solid, good quality 
virtual environment to provide students and we're going to be getting that word out about that. Um, what, uh, next up, we're um, later in this month, we're going to be dropping a postcard to three zip codes to promote our GED and adult basic education program. We think this is going to be well received and we're really excited about it. Um, we have a number of opportunities that we're working on. We have lists of um, the high school, current high school students, dual enrollment students, and um, we're working on various ways to, to continue to market to these students to, you know, we're, we've got some specific plans and then we've got some general plans um, that we think will resonate with this audience. What I really wanted to get to though, fine, at the end here, um, is the importance of marketing to our current students. So, you know, typically we make our current students aware of, uh, just aware of that it's time to register or time to complete their FAFSA, whatever it happens to be. But this year, we really feel like we need to market that to them as aggressively as we're marketing to prospective students. One, we know there is some dissatisfaction with virtual classes, um, but we know that you know, our students are really tough and they, they have stuck with it and they're working really hard and, and you know, they're gonna make it through the semester. But what we really need them to understand is why it's so important to continue not to take that time off. You know, you, you take that time off, you may never come back, right? And that's just not good for students. Um, so we want, so we're gonna do a postcard campaign to our current students. We're working on a video. Um, it's kind of a fun video, but it's empathetic at the same time, just to let people know that we're there for them and we'll help them get through it. It's gonna be great. Um, as we identify funding, we would like to be able to send ads, geofence their homes because we have their home addresses, send ads to their digital digital devices, just letting them know that, you know, they need to, we want them to come back, we're there for them, that they can finish and, and do quite well. And then as David mentioned a bit ago, um, you know, parting with enrollment management, um, admissions and STAR to, to offer various um, communications to this current audience. So that was very fast. If I could answer any questions, I'm happy to do so. Are there any questions from the board? Well, I, I have a first question, actually. Lisa, do you have the resources you need to be able to really continue to aggressively market in this really uncertain time? I mean, are you able to pivot dollars from, you know, billboards that people may not see because they're not leaving their homes as frequently to, um, to more digital tools? Well, so I just want to touch on billboards quickly since you mentioned it. The reason we were able to do billboards is because we got them at a significant discount for all the reasons you just said. But I've been out a little bit. Traffic is good. So we're feeling better about that. No, actually, we do need to identify um, some other funds. If we really want to be aggressive in some of this, we don't quite have the funds we need. We're, as it is, we're spending at least $100,000 less than we spent last summer for fall enrollment. You know, enrollment did go up, but we're working to, I, to see what we can do to identify those funds and like I said, repurpose some funds that um, you, that we would have used for other, other things right now. So we are working on that. Okay. Chancellor Lambert, as you know- I love the billboards. Yeah. Sorry. Great. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Ms. Garcia. Oh, Dr. A. No, I'm on Speedway every day and I just love those billboards. I see them They're, and there's a lot of people out. So I think people are seeing them. They look great. Mr. Hanna. Yeah, Lisa, so you may have mentioned this, but, uh, uh, and, and um, I know you were aware of this, but we're hearing some uh, reluctance from some of the students who have been accepted to the U of A to go back there because of the face-to-face -face classes. And, you know, I hate to be counter programming against our partners, but this is definitely an opportunity, I think, for us to say, it's safer at Pima. I don't. I don't think no that's. No way. No, Mark. Mark, come on. That's not the right. U of A is going to do hybrid. It's going to do online, and there'll be a few in face classes. That is absolutely unfair and not called for. <laughs> I agree, but I, I'm just telling you that we are hearing that. So. <laughs> well, our messages are reaching those students, and and for all the reasons that you say, you know, I think a lot of students are weighing that virtual environment, and if they want to be on big campuses and all we're saying is here's what Pima has to offer. We offer a quality program that transfers at a discounted tuition. If you want to come to Pima, we would love to have you be an Aztec. Ms. Garcia, Mr. Gonzalez, any additional questions or comments for Ms. Brodsky? Okay, 
Um, Chancellor Lambert, I would just say, you know, I think now more than ever, you know, we, we talk about this every year during the budget about the need to continually make incremental in increases to the marketing side of our house uh, into the base every year. And I, and I know funding is going to be very complex this year more than ever before, but I think it's more critical than ever that we provide the resources to, uh, to our marketing department to really be able to make the case in new ways uh, to audiences that um, I think are going to need them in a variety of different, uh, different, for a different variety of different reasons. So, um, you know, again, I'd like to, I'd like to see in in the uh, you know final budget matrix more funding for uh, for marketing because I think it's urgent. And I think that's why when we presented to to the board the the issue around the tuition increases, and we were advocating for good portion of that going to marketing. And I hope that the board will continue to support that. So as you get to the decisions around the, but the budget we're gonna post uh, for tomorrow for the public, that that discussion keeps in mind the points you just made. I think marketing is always critical, but I think it's gonna be even more critical during this period of time. And so we certainly don't wanna go backwards in the investments. The other important piece to not lose sight of it's easy to take for granted that because we are more locally focused, that we don't have to put as much into marketing. And I think the contrary is true. We need to continue to increase and support the marketing efforts and not fall into the trap that because we're local and we're the only game in town, people are gonna to come to us. I think we gotta keep, keep promoting our, our story. Hello? Ian, can you hear me? I, uh, I apologize. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so if there are no additional <laughs> questions uh, from the board, I would say uh, that we'll move to our next item, the short-term IT offerings with Ian Rourke, our Vice President for Workforce Development and Strategic Partnership. Mr. Rourke. Good afternoon, board chair, board members, Chancellor Lambert, Pima Community College colleagues, peers, community members, and friends of Pima, um, thank you very much, Lisa, for mentioning some of what we're going to talk about today with the Google IT certificate. As an end user and for a team who is out there trying to get more awareness to the diversity of offerings that Pima Community College has, including with short-term training and workforce development, including virtual offerings, Lisa and her team have done a phenomenal job, and we have been very impressed with the level of sophistication that some of these techniques that she discussed in her presentation have brought about, including some of the items that we will be talking about today. So there are a lot of things to set context that were already underway with respect to the pre-COVID-19 world versus the post-COVID-19 world. And we've talked about many of these and have heard from our chancellor, from Dr. David DeRay, from Provost um, uh, Dolores Perón Cerda and others about the industry 4.0 and the impact of technology on learning and working. We know that the traditional workforce pipeline has been challenged by the decrease of what we in workforce call the emerging workforce or the emerging learner ages 16 to 24 because by birth dearth alone, by decreasing birth rates alone, the traditional population and thus the traditional pipeline for enrollment and for the workforce is decreasing. And we've seen with the advent of technology, particularly AI and automation, that many occupations are blending and that occupational specific career trajectories are no longer the reality in our workplace. Many of our students will not stay in the area in which they train. They will actually enter blended occupations and career lattices rather than linear career pathways. We also see this convergence of technologies to where upskilling and recareering will be ne necessary and will be the norm rather than the exception. And we've seen case in point in our institution, the success and the replication of the Applied Technology Academy that was originally designed for Caterpillar. We've also been a leader in Arizona with respect to work-based learning and ensuring that work-based learning opportunities increase and that includes Pima and doesn't sideline Pima in the process. We've also seen that our employers are interested not just in 
the certification or the degree, but the actual skill set that it represents. So these shifts were already underway in response. Virtualization or hybridization of the classroom and the workplace. The blending of working and learning through work-based learning. Traditional sectors being blurred and melded together. IT and manufacturing, for instance, with the smart manufacturing or industry 4.0. Career, career uh, pathway stacks and lattices, such as with iBest and the great work that adult education is doing by proving that people who do not have even a high school diploma yet can be successful in earning their GED and industry recognized certification at the same time, as well as a FEMA certificate. And so this has really lended or moved us forward in needing to advance post traditional offerings. And so from a workforce development context, we get asked a lot, what has this caused to change? It really hasn't caused anything to change. It has served nothing but an accelerant for change in these domains that were already underway. To exemplify this, work that was already being um, performed, if you will, or a project that was already underway pre-COVID has really demonstrated um, its viability and its need in a post-COVID world. And that is with the Google IT certificate. Um, and you can see the cover of a manual that we have from Jobs for the Future and Google for implementing this program. A brief bit of historical context, about a year and a half ago, Google in partnership with Jobs for the Future as their national intermediary, launched this among community colleges in urban areas in Texas, New York, and California. We applied to be in that cohort at the time, um, but were not accepted. They only piloted it in three urban areas, Dallas, LA, and New York. However, we were called by Jobs for the Future to not only implement this for their second round of implementation, but to lead a cohort of Arizona colleges. And I'm proud to say that Pima is leading this cohort of eight of our 10 community college districts, including Maricopa, that are participating in the statewide launch of the Google IT Professional Support Certificate. There's a lot on this slide and I won't go point by point, but with that first bullet that you see with the five courses, this is, this is a robust entry level certificate. There are skills here that go above and beyond the daily user usability or digital skills that you and I bring to the workforce or to being able to navigate through Zoom in this meeting. This is an interesting model because it is purely competency-based, wholly delivered online through Coursera with assessments and labs through Quick Labs, and it integrates video, readings, and assessments throughout. Equally, the certification has been aligned to another industry recognized credential um, called CompTIA and students who go through this certificate will be co-badged, if you will, in both the CompTIA certification as well as the Google IT certificate. And finally, learners will have digital access to a nationwide job board where they will be able to access virtual jobs as well as physical jobs that will be scaffolded and tiered based on locality, Pima County, Arizona, nationwide. And so there is digital integration with our career services and student services folks. Google IT certification program has a lot of implications, things that we were already in development in, but have now been brought to the forefront with meeting the needs of the displaced workers, those that have been laid off and those that have been furloughed as a result of the economic downturn of the COVID-19 crisis. This is an opportunity for us to offer non-credit in a wholly virtual environment, but using the same quality of delivery as our credit programs. This is being offered with a wraparound support shell, if you will, in D2L. These non-credit learners will have access to Pima Community College faculty. In our case, and would like to thank, this is going to be Manny Durazo in the IT area, as well as access to student support services through D2L. Equally, this program is being listed on the local and the state eligible training provider list as a part of the Arizona at work system. That means that those individuals who qualify due to a loss of job and are going to be entered into collecting unemployment benefits will be able to access funding through the Arizona at work system to pay for this training and similar trainings that Pima is developing in this regard. And finally, as I said, that this was our partnership across eight Arizona community college districts and everybody has been really collaborative to meet the needs and sees this as meeting the needs of these workers who are hurting in this time. For Pima specifically, because we have been a leader with prior learning assessment in the state of Arizona, 
and in working with our leadership of the IT program, Dean Jim Craig, Chris Bondhorst and faculty, this will stack into our IT certificate and cybersecurity programs so that non-credit learners who are perhaps taking this in the moment to get that next best job as we come into economic recovery can continue their education in a credit program at Pima Community College without any loss of time or resources. And this is an example of the work that workforce development in partnership with CTE areas across the college is doing to bring this to scale and replicate in areas of workforce and economic growth. As a teaser and for future opportunities to discuss, we will be moving this program and others into an online marketplace known as Unmuddle, where we'll be partnering with other colleges across the nation to ensure that working learners have access to the quality content in a virtual and a hybrid format that Pima delivers, as well as with NC3, the National Coalition of Certification Centers, who's been a national leader in ensuring that in this COVID crisis, um, individuals who are in applied technology programs can continue as much as possible as their applied technology training. And we'll be working with Dean Wilson and others to ensure that we will be implementing these hybrid offerings of NC3 into short-term training that stacks into applied technology at Pima Community College. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a number of people who have been involved, and this is by, by no means um, a comprehensive list. But in workforce development, I'd like to thank Tamara Nicolosi, Jessica Normoyle, Anna Greif, with IT, Dean Jim Craig, and Chris Bondhorst. Chris has been absolutely amazing and has put in many hours into this curriculum alignment piece. Our faculty member, Manny Durazo, as well as Lisa and Paul and the rest of the marketing folks for helping us out with the geo cash. It's, it's, we are seeing instant results with this. It is great. And as well as Dr. DeRay, Dr. Duran Serda, and Chancellor Lambert for their leadership and support for allowing us to move these post-traditional offerings forward at scale. That, if you have any questions, we'd love to entertain them and answer. Well, first of all, Ian, thank you so much for the um, outstanding presentation and the great work you're doing. Sign me up. I'm looking forward to uh, taking some of these uh, some of these courses. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Hanna, it looks like you have a question. I do. Uh, Ian, what is the cost of the this program? The Google. It's an excellent. It's an excellent question. So, um, we had at first pre-COVID, we were looking at this with Go so Google. This is a nationwide experiment to test the market viability in partnership with CompTIA. So, as a part of this partnership, the site licenses to the Coursera course have been waived by Google and Jobs for the Future, which lowered the cost to around at that time around eight hundred dollars per participant. Through different cost savings internally, we were able to lower that just under 500 in response to the COVID-19. Um, the ink is not yet dry. There are some folks on this call who will be receiving um, sign-offs um, through, through Adobe this evening that will perhaps allow us to have some funding from our partners at Center for the Future of Arizona that will be dedicated to further lowering that cost to what we project will be under $100 per participant. Wow. Um, and that will be for the duration of about the next um, year or just shy of a year. After this crisis is over and after, and, and hopefully that the economic return has come back up and the Google site license will then be a part of the costing structure, we will have to um, reassess the costing structure at that time. But we really wanted to do as much as we could to lower that cost for non-credit learners in the short term. If you are a dislocated worker and going to the Arizona uh, Pima County Center, um, Job Center, you of course are eligible for up to $3,000 in terms of vouchers to use at Pima Community College programs, including this one. So it would be free uh, to the dislocated worker in those instances. Thanks, thank you. Any other questions from members of our board? Okay, last call, okay. Hearing none, we're on to our next uh, set of reports, our administrative reports. Um, the first report is going to be from Brooke Anderson, our faculty, uh, our faculty representative. Um, and I just want to remind all of our representatives, uh, you know, please, I, under, I know it's difficult in these, uh, you know, chaotic times, but please get your reports in the Friday before the meeting so we can post them and make sure that, um, that we, um, um, they're available to the public, but also that you're able to report. I know we made an exception this meeting just because of how things have been moving, but please in the future, if you could do that. So uh, Ms. Anderson, you are up. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. 
All right. Um, and so I just want to um, also just sort of um, follow up with what everyone else has been talking about today. And that is that um, faculty, like everyone else at the college, is working to adjust to these times. And much of uh, my report is going to cover um, the ways in which faculty have been working um, in this new environment. So uh, thanks to the recent Hanover COVID Pulse surveys that the provost office has sent to students, faculty are aware that a large portion of our students have had difficulty staying engaged and motivated with online virtual instruction. Um, common reasons for these struggles are that students are experiencing increased stress due to the way COVID-19 is impacting their lives. They lack access to reliable high quality and they lack experience and comfort in an online virtual learning environment. Um, so Senate is collecting faculty ideas for engaging and motivating students in online virtual classes in a working document that we've shared with the board titled Increasing Motivation and Engagement in Online Virtual Classes. And of course, this will be a continuing conversation for faculty into future semesters um, that we will be adjusting to this new reality. Um, another thing that faculty have been discussing, of course, is the faculty experience teaching virtually, uh, including the benefits and drawbacks to some of the virtual tools that uh, many faculty who were just teaching face to face and had to transition those classes to a virtual environment have been discussing like Zoom and the virtual classroom embedded in Brightspace and some other kinds of uh, tools. And we're sharing that information with administration as we move forward and figure out the best way to deliver this new, um, basically this new kind of tool and almost modality for learning. Um, also, you know, like many students, especially given the sudden nature of the shift, uh, not all faculty have the technology and internet access they need to teach in this new environment. And so we've been talking with faculty and with administration about these issues and working to find solutions to those problems. Uh, and uh, our fall schedule, of course, is impacted by these times. And the deans and faculty and department heads have been working together to prepare a fall semester that if necessary, can keep most classes in a largely virtual and or online environment. And faculty are preparing to offer classes in hybrid, virtual and online modalities that can respect social distancing protocols and keep everyone safe. Thank goodness for the Teaching and Learning Center. They have been such a wonderful resource for faculty. I'm so glad that we have this center. Um, we are continuing to have under Maisie Mod's leadership, um, professional development for faculty as the fall semester or the spring semester is ending and the summer semester is beginning. Some of those things that are still going on right now are faculty for faculty help hours. And then also on Friday afternoons, we have a nice um, Zen moments session to help faculty recenter and relax and de-stress from all of this um, change. Uh, the Teaching and Learning Center has also been partnering with Pima Online and the Dean's Group to identify um, in response to the pandemic, the TLC's um, areas where they can also help with professional development and support for all those who are teaching in new environments. And they're archiving these events. So even if faculty are not able to make it to the scheduled events, they are able to access the recorded events and get the benefit of that learning. So that, that ends the informative part of my report. And I just want to end um, with some celebration of some of the wonderful, notable accomplishments of our faculty here at the end of the spring semester. Elena Grijada, a Spanish faculty and Pima Online Department Head for World Languages and Reading received the Distinguished Educator Award for Excellence in E-Learning at the ITC Instructional Technology Council 2020 Annual Conference e-learning in Charleston, South Carolina. University of Arizona astronomer and longtime astronomy part-time faculty member for Pima Community College, Andres Gasper, was recently featured in the New York Times. 
and a number of other media sources for a recent discovery that he made. So I have provided the link to a New York Times article for the board to learn more about his discovery. Uh, then, of course, a lot of the notable accomplishments have to do with the ways in which faculty have been stepping up and helping our students adjust to this new virtual environment. So the PCC band has uploaded a virtual performance onto YouTube and Mark Nelson, the music faculty and department head uh, member has composed a piece for the band. Carol Christofferson, another music faculty member, has recorded a virtual clarinet lesson with student Bryce Cravazzo, who performs a movement of Robert Schumann's fantasy pieces for clarinet and piano. And then we had, under the leadership of Francisca James Hernandez, who's the Anthropology and Mexican American Studies faculty and head of the Ethnic, Gender, and Transporter Studies and sociology department lead the first virtual EGTS summit. This happened on April 28th from 9 to 4 p.m. And the theme was healing community and Corona times, education, migration, and identity. And the keynote speaker was Bambi Saucedo. She's a transgender and migrant rights activist and scholar and president of Trans Latin Ad, uh, Ad Coalition. Tonight, we have another virtual event hosted by Molly, Molly McCloy. She's writing faculty and the Kababi coordinator. And this event tonight is the virtual release party for Kababi, which is our um, literary magazine for employees. It starts tonight at 530. Join if you can. It should be a nice celebration of the creative work of our people. Um, also, of course, we have Sanscript, our student literary magazine. And under the leadership of Frankie Rollins, writing faculty, um, she and her students switched to a digital format and platform in March. And the students uh, rallied around this new challenge and created the very first digital version of this magazine after 26 years of print editions. So Sanskrit 2020 will be released online on May 16th. And on that day, a link to the magazine will um, go out to everyone. And then finally, one final um, sort of notable accomplishment is that Frankie Rollins has also released a book this month called The Grief Manuscript. And that's published by Finishing Line Press. So thank you, everyone. Um, it has been a crazy semester. And uh, we have really rallied together. And uh, it's been really great to see that. Brooke, thank you so much for the report. Um, also, in the I, I while you were talking, I, I looked at the increasing motivation and engagement in online virtual classes. But that the link you sent is actually locked. So, is there if there's any way you could send that to the board um, so that we could just resend it directly to the to the board so that we can take a look. Sure. So. Yes, I'll make sure to to get that to you. Thank you very much. Again, we really appreciate um, the work of the entire faculty and, uh, and and the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. Next, we have a, a report from Sean Mendoza, our um, adjunct faculty representative. Mr. Mendoza. There we go. All right, um, thank you, Chairman Klinko, Chancellor Lambert, members of the board and honored guests. As we learn to uh, balance the safety and academic success of our students, adjunct faculty have continued to play an important role in helping the college transition traditionally face-to-face -face classes to an online learning environment. According to the, uh, to the provost office, approximately two-thirds or a little over 300, uh, sorry, 600 part-time faculty heard the call and took an, an active role uh, in the transition. As experts in their respective fields and with responsibilities outside of the institution, fair compensation of our contributions to student success is of great concern. I'm happy to report that with the support of Chancellor Lambert, Provost Duran Serta, and uh, David B, money had been identified to compensate adjunct faculty who have worked to put face-to-face -face classes uh, to an online environment. A one-time payment of approximately $400 per class will appear on this Friday's check. Um, and with that, I would like to publicly say thank you to the board, college administration for your uh, continued support and recognition uh, of adjunct faculty contributions to the institution. And that uh, ends my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Mendoza. Again, we appreciate the uh, work of all of the adjuncts uh, in this unusual time and the work that you've done to make sure 
that things uh, have run as smoothly as possible. So thank you. Next, we have uh, Michael Lopez. Mr. Lopez. Hello, Chairman Klinko. Hello, Chairman Klinko, Chancellor Lambert, governing board members, fellow colleagues and guests. Uh, briefly, our last staff council meeting was on uh, May 1st, uh, revised bylaw uh, discussion continues. Uh, the election committee work is uh, continuing in, uh, in regards to possible restructuring of uh, staff council representatives uh, to include not just campus, but uh, department, uh, um, departments as, as much as possible throughout the district. And um, I just, the transition and where we're at right now has been really uh, very difficult for everyone, I'm sure. But here in Tucson, uh, it feels like the energy is good. The town hall that the chancellor uh, addressed the community uh, the other day was, it was really energetic just to hear or know that there's, everyone is still out there and, and hanging together and working hard. So um, our next um, staff council meeting will be June 5th. If there's any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, Mr. Lopez. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, our next item is our chancellor's report. Well, good Chancellor afternoon, Lambert? everybody. Yes, can you hear me? Good afternoon. Um, so I, like everyone else, I, I just wanna start out and say thank you to our faculty, to our staff, to our administration and the board and our students for making uh, this transition as smooth as it could be. Uh, we should all be proud that we have all stepped up and focused on what matters most, and that's the health of one another, as well as the success of our students. So I'm very proud of everybody. Uh, if For the board members who did not get a chance to see uh, the town hall uh, that Mike was referring to, I really would encourage you to look at that. I think that really showcase what is very special about this place. And so I, I hope you'll take that one hour and have a chance to experience that. Also, uh, uh, we held a student town hall and I wanna thank uh, Dolores and David and Suzanne and Irene and so many other people for working with the student leaders to put that student town hall together. And that was a phenomenal event as well. And we should be so pleased about of our student leaders. They really stepped up, they were positive, they were encouraging uh, for, for their fellow uh, uh, students. Uh, also, uh, I just wanna just again echo a thank you to Norma and that incredible group of folks. And one of Norma's rewards is, I've uh, said to ACCT reached out to me and they wanted to do an interview on what Pima has done for the CARES Act. And I said, well, I'd like you to talk to the person who led that for us, which is Norma. So Norma, you're here and probably, Norma already knows this, that I've connected her with ACCT to do that interview because Pima really is a leader in how, how to address uh, the distribution and really stepping up and making this happen for our students. Uh, unfortunately, still a lot of schools have not distributed those funds. Uh, and there's a lot of schools who still have not received the funds. And so we're just so fortunate that that's not the case for us. I think uh, Ian really uh, showcased uh, some of the re changing realities in the higher education landscape. This was already going on pre-COVID. It's easy to mistake and confuse the COVID reality for the larger reality that was already underway. And so I'm glad that, uh, that Ian really hit some of those important points, but also want to just uh, stress that, that what we're seeing is more and more workers want to consume non-degree or skill-based education and training. Uh, and that's going, to, that's going to 
challenge us as traditional providers of higher education when you have more and more individuals wanting to have access to non-traditional methods of acquiring skills uh, along the way. And the Google IT certification is just a prime example of that reality. Uh, also, um, graduation is next week. So hopefully all of you uh, uh, can participate uh, in the virtual graduation. We're so excited that we could put that together at Lisa's team under Christy Camargo's leadership and, and Dan and so many others really, really helped pull that together. And I'm just pleased that some of us, I believe Damian, you're also going to have a little message on there along with a message from our mayor to our, to our students. So we're just excited about that. And let me just close with a couple of other things. Uh, we have been uh, in continuous conversations with the University of Arizona. Uh, I, I, you know, I just wanna acknowledge President Robbins and his team because it's been very collaborative as we move through this effort. And not only through this period of time, but even prior to this, we had been working with the university. The university has been working on some exciting changes around general education. And I know uh, Dolores has been working with their provost on, on what that's gonna look like and how we might have to start to realign our own curriculum to continue to ensure a seamless transition for our students to the University of Arizona. I had a great opportunity to tour many of our facilities at the district. So I wanna thank Bill and his team. I've been in uh, constant uh, communications with uh, Senator Cinema and McSally's offices. Uh, and so we're just constantly just getting connected to what's happening nationally, statewide, and, and locally. So thank you all for your tremendous support. And we'll continue to uh, take our measured approach as we go through uh, this COVID crisis. Uh, you're gonna see that our approach is a little more conservative than some other organizations, but maybe not as conservative as others. So if you have Cal State uh, University system, is a little more conservative than our approach. Our approach is a little more conservative than the University of Arizona's approach. So just know there's not one right way to move forward, uh, but we're, we're trying to balance all of the interests, but health is the key driver, and alongside that is the success of our students. So thank you all. Thank you, Chancellor Lambert. And I, and I would just say, you know, I, I particularly appreciate uh, your philosophy in, in this whole ordeal in creating, allowing, and envisioning flexibility and rapid, you know, response to the changing environment, and really using that strategy to approach the summer and the fall, and understanding that things could change very quickly, and that, um, you know, if they do, we will change with them. So I, I really appreciate your teams and the leadership that you've provided to help guide that type of vision for um, for how we're going to proceed to really prioritize the safety of everyone within our college community. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, finally, we have, uh, okay, next we have our uh, information items. Um, Mr. Sylvan, if you could read the information items. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The information items are materials that were provided uh, to the board to provide a uh, greater context for the meeting and some of the board's decision-making. Those items were the February 2020 financial statements employment information listing uh, some new hires, separations and retirements, uh, individuals who've been certified as eligible to, to uh, serve as adjunct faculty at Pima Community College, administrative procedure changes. There were two, one was, uh, they're both new administrative procedures. One AP 3.05.01 deals with equal access to credit classroom learning that mostly addresses uh, some issues that had been faced by non-credit students. There's also AP 3.25.02, which describes the process around graduation. We have the uh, third quarterly report on revitalization funds. Those were funds, uh, one-time funds that the board and college allocated uh, for a variety of projects identified in, those, in that report. We have a report on how the first allocation under the CARES Act was, uh, was divvied up a report on the second allocation under the CARES Act, and finally, uh, the passage of an MO or the signing of an MOU with Sunnyside Unified School District, which uh, very generously allowed 
uh, Pima College students to take advantage of internet access through Wi-Fi hotspots that um, Sunnyside has created uh, around its district. Thank you very much. Next, we have our Thank consent you. agenda. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, made a comment about uh, the uh, in that report about the revitalization revi revitalization funds. Um, Buried in there is uh, a update on the dual enrollment program. And I just want to give a shout out to James Palacios and his team. You will not, if you look at that report and you see where we've come in terms of dual enrollment it is quite impressive. So I just wanted to point that out. And I would just add to that. I mean, I think we can see how successful this, these revitalization funds ha have worked. Uh, and as we're talking about the budget, perhaps we should be thinking about a revitalization fund 2.0. Okay, next we have our consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Sylvan, if you could read the consent agenda. Certainly, Mr. Chair. First item are the minutes from the April 1st, 2020 executive uh, board meeting, executive session board meeting. The second item is the April 1st, 2020 regular minute meetings. Next is the minutes for the April 3rd, 2020 special meeting. Then we have the minutes from the April 17th, 2020 special meeting. Uh, next item is approval of a new uh, position at Pima Community College, Director of Enterprise Risk Management. We have uh, inactivation of one program. That's a biosciences lab technician certificate for uh, direct employment. That program has been restructured. Next item is approval of a contract with Advanced uh, Technologies Consultants for an industrial cyber system, uh, not to exceed $515,020. Next item is approval of a construction contract with Lloyd Construction to move uh, lights from the East Campus to install on the soccer facility at the West Campus with a total uh, contract value not to exceed $278,097. Next, we have a contract with M3 Engineering and Technology Corporation for architectural services related to the aviation technology expansion project. The, um, the additional work being asked of M3 is $389,736. Uh, the total value of, of the uh, architecture and engineering services is, is uh, slightly over $1 million, $1.242 million. Uh, next, we have a contract amendment with BWS Architect Services that is for renovations of the science lab facilities on the West Campus with the additional work not to exceed $351,220. The total value of the architectural services they're providing related to this project is $537,324. Um, then the last item is a series of amendments to a variety of dual enrollment agreements we have with various schools um, uh, in the area. This is to add additional courses uh, to the dual enrollment offerings with these institutions. They include uh, Amphitheater School District, Eastern Valley Institute of Technology, Flowing Wells, uh, the Pima County JTED, Lourdes Catholic High School, Marana Unified School District, Patagonia uh, School District, Santa Cruz Unified School District. There are also uh, private schools, St. Augustine Catholic High School, Sunnyside Unified School District, Tank Verde Unified School District, Tucson Unified School District, and Vail Unified School District. All the specifics are contained in the amendments which are attached to the board report. Thank you, Mr. Silvan. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Okay, I heard Ms. Garcia. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Dr. Hay, thank you very much. All in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda, signify by saying, uh, oh, Mr. Hanna has a comment. Yes, I do. I just have a, a question. I, I just need a, a, a bit of explanation on the job classification, the Director of Enterprise Risk Management. Oh. Mr. Sylvan, could you give me just a quick update on that? Sorry, can you, I'm not sure I understand exactly what your question is. Are you asking how did that how was the job classified at the level it was classified at? No, I'm asking what what is uh, you oh. asking just a quick job description of that particular. Got it. I think I got it. Uh, let's try this. 
So it's a director level position. So that's one of the higher level staff positions, um, comparable positions around the community college would be like the head of contracts or purchasing. Um, the idea is we've combined, uh, so it's kind of a trend in, in larger organization management. It takes traditional risk management functions, which is really looking at how do we minimize risks to uh, bodily injury or property damage and what kind of insurance should we have to a more holistic approach to also look at financial risks, compliance, uh, reputational risks. So it's a way to make sure units are aligning their projects, both with the strategic goals of the college and the amount of risk we're willing to take, right? Because every business activity has a certain amount of risk. And then how do you make sure that you're looking at all types of risk and opportunities and sort of maximizing your opportunity potential while minimizing the risk side? So it's sort of a, it's, it's an enhanced type of project planning is, is one way to look at it. Mr. Hanna, you're on mute. This is at the director level and so it's not at technically at an administrator level, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, Ms. does that resolve your question? You're muted again. It does, thank you. Okay, <laughs> well, We have an active motion on the table, table to approve the consent agenda. All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Gonzalez? Mr. Yes, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay. Anyone opposed? I said aye. Okay, you said I. Okay, so nobody is opposed. <laughs> okay, just back here. Uh, then the motion passes uh, unanimously. Next, we have our action items. The first is our uh, action item 5.1, the capital budget plan for fiscal year 2021. Mr. Sullivan, if you could read uh, the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For this item, the Chancellor recommends the Governing Board approve $11,764,000 in capital projects and estimated life cycle needs for fiscal year 2021. Do I have a, a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. Okay. Okay. That's why I heard an, I heard a recommendation, uh, a motion by Ms. Garcia and uh, Mr. Gonzalez, was that a second? Yeah. Okay, terrific. So uh, now we have a discussion. So uh, Chancellor Lambert. Yes, uh, I, I am pleased to uh, recommend approval of this particular item. As you'll see in the details that we have attached that uh, a number of the uh, areas in which we would be using the funds would span the academic divisions and a variety of the campuses in terms of uh, uh, other details related to this, I'd be glad to have uh, Bill Ward or Dave B address any detailed questions you might have about the, the plan. Does anyone have any questions? Could, uh, I, I would just ask that Bill Ward just kind of skim over some of the higher uh, value items on the, on the capital plan. Yes. Um, so Mr. Ward, have, while you're doing that, if you could also just note in specific the aviation expansion, the funding not covered by the state, if you could just highlight what exactly that's covering. Chairman, uh, Chairman Cleek now, board, governing board members, Chancellor Lambert, uh, students, colleagues, and guests. And so I, the question is, is you would like me to go over the, could you say that one more time, uh, board member Hannah? Yeah, just a brief, just a brief explanation of some of the higher dollar items on the capital plan. And then, and then Chair Klinko, you had mentioned something too? Yes, in particular, the uh, the $1.5 million um, for the- Aviation expansion. Aviation, okay. and for the aviation deficit. So if you could just talk about what exactly that's gonna cover. Okay, the, there. so we put in a buffer of $1.5 million for aviation because there is a, a bunch of work that we're gonna to have to do related to, to uh, putting in a, a, a drain for the facility. And so uh, we are going to be able to apply for a grant. And so we've been working with the EPA in the state of Arizona, which it's a state EPA grant. And, and we're, they have talked to us and told us that we looks like we make end out qualifying for about $1.5 million 
but but we will not be able if we get it, which we we're we're working with them right now. And then once we're able to apply, we'll be working with our our grants office within the college to submit it. But if we don't get the grant, then we just want to make sure that we have the dollars because this is not in, not incorporated into the project because we really don't know what we're going to run into related to when we run this drain line. And then and we've already done some preliminary work. Uh, but uh, there is going, they're going to have to run a, a line from the building into a basin uh, actually out from the property. And so that's something that, uh, that our architects, that's actually one of, the, one of the reasons why the cost for the architects was expanded for the aviation too, was because one, we had them give us a price for acceleration and also to do more site re work related to the fact that that place is a, is a super fun site. And so it's a buffer. Uh, in case we don't get the money, and then and then if we do get the grant money, then that money could actually be taken away or potentially utilized uh, for equipment for the project if needed. And so then, Bill, uh, a, Bill, Bill, once you address the card access and the two point five tied to that, yeah. And so what we've done too is is and I and I can go down is we've listed um, and, and and a number of these projects, and I'll just go down the list list answer which will kind of explain because I have it, I have it right in front of me. And so um, what we'll be doing is, is that, as you know, we've added the additional dollars to, to what I just said for the, for the assessment of the site. Also to, you know, when we looked at these facilities, we didn't know how detailed we were going to get with them and what all we were going to add to them with our original estimates. And so once we've seen a design, then we're able to actually come back with a cost related to what it would take us to put in card access cameras and things like that because that is going to actually be a standard for all of our all of our buildings and so uh, so that's what that's for is card access uh, uh, for the facility um, and then we we also have um, we we're actually doing that which will also be the transportation facility and we will also be doing card access which we'll be talking about at a later date for the manufacturing facility so that's what that's for and then um if you look at the uh, uh of the equ total equipment and i'll just go down the list so um but we're looking at a total of 200 or 200 2 million 550 for card access and security equipment which is broken down as follows so 275 for the new transportation center 275 for aviation three 20 approximately one third plan for cameras and that would be college wide all over the district and then 1.6 uh 1.7 million for card access card access is very expensive you know we have thousands of doors all over the district one of the things we're actually looking at related to our card access and i've talked with the chancellor about this is we've done some walk through you know, we, we, the college is not, in my opinion, going to be able to afford to put cards everywhere, but what we're trying to do is put them at key doors to where people can access facilities. And then eventually, if you guys notice, we've actually also added some types of systems and buildings where you can actually use your card and go in and then check out keys. And so that's what that's for, um, uh, for the whole district. And then we also, as I mentioned, I listed the aviation, and then we've got a total of 3,695,000 uh, allocated to our IT team. And this is, in my, this is for a lot of stuff that they do related to their technological replacements throughout the district and also in the data center and also for them to keep up with the technology. And so they, they're, they're gonna be utilized, they're gonna be asking for about 1.2 million for IT network equipment replacements, 1 million for enterprise systems and tech allocation, 700,000 for IT academic technology allocation, 410,000 for IT data center equipment and replacement and 400,000 for IT administration technology allocation. And these are things that they continue to ask for throughout the, you know, every, every year during this time so that they can keep up with their deferred maintenance and also with the, the changing things at the college. And then we've got another $475,000 on the table for our robotics uh, equipment that's going to be added to the new program that the college has, de has developed. And so that's something that, uh, um, that we will be purchasing also. And, another, and then we always ask as part of our, um, our college deferred maintenance is we ask for HVAC improvements every year. 
And so that's the tone of 450,000. We're actually going to be utilizing some of that money, not, not just this money, but the money that we have now too, for the uh, science, uh, science renovations at the West Campus. When we originally put that project together, we were just looking at two and a half million for science and then two and a half million for the, the medical side of things. And then since we decided to look at the at, at potentially developing a new, a new medical facility, are, are also looking at retrofitting some of our buildings with, with the 35 million that we talked about. So that money was moved over to the labs. And then we we started looking at our air conditioning. I didn't think it would be fair, Chancellor and board, for us to charge the project uh, for deferred maintenance. And so some of the deferred maintenance dollars will be actually utilized to replace the air conditioning systems in those two major classrooms. And then, as you know, we're, we always have to keep our elevators up to date and modernized. And so this is something that we are required to do. And so we're asking for about 400 grand for that. And then, um, and then also to um, for our educational facilities master plan, which is also going to be coming up. We have a meeting scheduled with our chancellor tomorrow, and that's at the tone of three hundred and sixty-five thousand. And then, and then one of the things that we talked about is, and I, and I, and I, and 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 the chancellor and I have talked about this in the past, but I just wanted to, you know, give the board a little more information. Is is that. We've got all these different types of operating systems related to security, safety, fire alarm, suppression systems. Um, we've we're, we've installed, installed our new mass notification system. And so one of the things that we'd like to do is to develop a, a security master plan so that entities know where everything is, where it's located and it's shared with everybody. And then when law enforcement fire, whoever shows up on our sites, they can actually access that and actually have real-time information related to what the college has. Um, and then all the projects that I'm listed that I'm talking about are the ones that are um, above the limit. And so the last one would be the the IT CLE equipment, um, which is the which is what we are, are purchasing um, uh, to, and that's three hundred thirty-one thousand dollars. And then the rest of it is under the under the the uh, the, the threshold. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ward. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, we'll take a vote. And uh, Mr. Silvan, I think for these, let's just do a roll call vote for all these votes. I think it'll just be a little bit easier. So if we could have a roll call vote. Mr. Mr. Planko? Yes. Mr. Hanna? Yes. Dr. Hay? Yes. Uh, Ms. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Gonzalez. Yes. Right. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks uh, so much, board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ward, for all your work keeping the facilities, you know, in tip top shape. Um, next is the proposed property tax levy for fiscal year 2021. Mr. Sylvan, if you could read the recommendation. The chancellor recommends the governing board remain levy neutral for fiscal year 2021 property taxes. And what that means is that the college would not increase the property tax rate for the upcoming fiscal year. Okay, so I do not believe we need a motion for that recommendation. So unless anybody is interested in increasing the, <laughs> increasing the, the levy, uh, now is your opportunity to make a motion. Okay, hearing none, uh, the, um, there will be no, uh, we won't move to a public hearing at the next meeting. Uh, and I do wanna say that, you know, the college, um, I think this is reflective of the college's overarching concern, not just for right. in, in the internal uh, structure, but also for our community at large and that putting an additional tax burden on people of Pima County uh, would be inappropriate at this moment in time. So um, I think this is part of the college's so sense of social responsibility to the, uh, to the whole community. So thank you everybody for your inaction on this item. Okay, next we have our fiscal year 2021 proposed budget for the governing board review and possible revision and adoption at the June 2020 special meeting. Do I, do you want to, do we have a recommendation for this or is it, we just have the presentation and then we give feedback or what's Mr. Sullivan? So uh, for this item, 
uh, the board will hear what the general uh, proposed budget outline parameters are. And then if you want to make changes, if, if the board, if, if the majority of the board would like to make changes to any of those, this would be the time to do it. And the significance of the proposed budget is the next action item is going to be for the board to direct publication of the proposed budget. And what's significant about that is whatever proposed budget we publish is the maximum budget we can have for the year. So the board could always, we could always adjust down, but we cannot adjust up. And by setting this proposed budget, that's going to, uh, so it's gonna define the outer expenditure of the college. And of course, it's also going to uh, reinforce the board's uh, position regarding a tax increase or not, because depending on what proposed budget you uh, would pass uh, for us to publish, uh, we either would or would not have to go through the, prop, uh, the process related to a tax increase. So, so there's no action related to this item. Uh, this is more for information and then the action is the next. Level. Correct. So that the college administration knows if we're going to have to make adjustments uh, for the budget that we're actually going to propose budget, excuse me, that we will publish as part of our public notice and uh, budget approval process. Okay, Mr. Lambert. Uh, it Yes, and I think the other pieces about this, there were certain assumptions uh, going into the budget that the board had approved, uh, primarily around tuition, and then and how we would allocate out that additional revenue. So we wanted to have a discussion that uh, goes back and re-examine those assumptions. Do those assumptions still hold for the board, or should we rethink some of that? So I'm going to have uh, Dave uh, kind of take you through some of these pieces. And that will help us think through what ultimately will be the final budget you'll approve. Dr. B. Let's see, okay. Uh, Chairperson Klinko, members of the board, Chancellor Lambert, colleagues and guests. Um, just wanna make sure, cause my screen does not show my share. Did I, uh, is the presentation showing up? It is, Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Uh, let me switch, sorry for this, but I need to switch what my screen looks like so I can see that. Okay, there we go. Um, so uh, good afternoon and uh, probably based on how long my talk will be, I'm gonna give a preliminary uh, good evening also, but hopefully we'll stay in the afternoon most of the time. Um, it's my pleasure uh, today to give you an overview of the proposed budget. Um, a, the May budget is really our chance to take all of the pieces of information that we've been discussing throughout the budget development in the, uh, the spring, uh, consolidate it all into a singular proposed budget and then get the board's feedback uh, so that with the le next action item uh, on the agenda to formally uh, publish and uh, um, put it out for public review so that the board can adopt it formally at the, uh, at the June board meeting. Um, so uh, as uh, uh, Chancellor Lambert mentioned, uh, one of the things that we're gonna go through is we're gonna th go through some of the key parameters that we put into the budget development uh, and uh, provide an opportunity for conversation uh, as we're going through this presentation. So please uh, feel free to stop me midway or if we wanna have a, uh, a stop to discuss particular items, uh, please do so and, and uh, rather than waiting for the end when I have comments and questions, that sort of thing. Uh, so starting with projected revenues, and we've had a lot of conversations in the last co uh, few weeks about what the implications are of the COVID crisis, uh, both in the short term and the longer term, um, and uh, which ones would have an effect and what we would fold into the budget. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the board in March approved tuition and fees, an increase of $2.50. Uh, to bring it to an $87 per credit in-state resident rate. That generates uh, in our flat enrollment scenario about $1.1 million. Uh, as you just discussed, uh, we are recommending and we're going forward with a levy neutral property tax scenario. So that's, uh, we do get an increase in property taxes from growth in new property of $2 million. Uh, but what that what the decision to go levy neutral rather than uh, going with an, uh, a levy increase scenario is that we are foregoing $2.4 million. So in other words, 
uh, the, the colleges uh, foregoing the opportunity, recognizing that uh, econo uh, economic circumstances and the financial pressures on our community are, are great and that uh, we're choosing to not push that increase to the community um, and, uh, and serve, serve the college or serve, and serve the community in that way. Um, we, we did fold in uh, reductions in Prop 301 money, that sales tax base revenue, auxiliary revenues, investment earnings. So those are some of the things that we've talked with the board about. And we quickly uh, turned that around and, and changed some of the parameters in the budget. Um, and then switching over to expenditure priorities, uh, the budget is based on a flat enrollment scenarios. And we had a discussion with the board uh, a few weeks ago about different enrollment projection models that uh, our institutional research folks have been working on, uh, ranging from flat to reductions uh, that could be 15% uh, or greater. Um, and so the, the budget, because it is a capacity document that we are, we are basically saying this is the maximum amount, the, the budget that we're trying to set is the maximum amount that, that we're allowed to spend. Um, what we are able to do then is if enrollment is flat and or if it grow, goes up, that we have the budget capacity to be able to provide that education. Uh, to the students coming in. That means that if we have a bunch of, uh, if extra students come in, uh, and you heard from uh, Lisa Broski earlier, um, some of the dynamics at play with higher education and the fact that students are thinking of, of gap years, or they're thinking about, well, maybe I'm gonna take a gap year from a residential college experience or a high tuition experience. Um, and, and there's potential then that the college uh, we'll have increases in enrollment that what we want to have is the ability to add sections, to add adjunct faculty taught sections, uh, and uh, to be able to provide the education for those students. And so that's why we're, we, and we talked with the board about this uh, in the study session, is that building a, a budget that has the ability to handle that growth is important to be able to respond but it does not preclude us from reducing or spending less than the budget. So that, that's why the budget looks more similar to what we were talking about earlier in, in the spring uh, than it does uh, in terms of what you're hearing the university looking at where they clearly have to reduce the budget um, because they have known revenue declines. Uh, we're in a different situation where we actually may have increases in enrollment and, and we really need to be able to respond to that. So with that said, the budget is the basis that it's based on a flat enrollment. We do have reserves uh, set aside uh, for enrollment uh, increases. Um, and again, we would be able to adapt and I'll show you a little bit about how the scenarios would work uh, if there is a reduction in enrollment. Um, right now, as the board has given direction up to this point, is that the budget includes a 1% COLA increase for regular staff, faculty, administrator salary pools. It includes a 1.5% increase to the adjunct faculty load rates. It includes uh, $450,000 to add six additional advising positions, uh, an additional $500,000 for marketing. I will note that that's a reduction from the current year, um, which is uh, temporarily this year, we added a million dollars for marketing uh, over what the base level is. And so what this is doing is it's taking the base and it's adding $500,000. Um, that uh, we have included in this $500,000 to do uh, facility retrofitting. Um, that is anticipating that uh, when students come back for face-to-face -face, that we're gonna have to do some modifications to our spaces uh, to ensure safety uh, and uh, that, that, uh, in terms of distancing and so forth uh, in our facilities. So it does include that. Um, it does fold in as we talked about, yeah. So did you say that that, so the refitting would come out of the marketing budget? No, 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 no. no. I'm just saying that the budget, we oh, were able to fold that into the budget. Yeah, no, it's it's not, they're, they're just lined up side by side. So I sort of went from one topic to the other, sorry. Right. I'll have to signal more more of a change when I, the next time I change my lane. Um, the, uh, it includes a uh, million dollars in academic efficiency savings, which we also talked about during the, the tuition discussion, that is uh, really refining our schedule and improving the classroom fill rates 
um, and uh, recognizing savings from being more efficient in terms of how we fund our classroom. Uh, we just talked about the capital budget. Um, it includes the revenue bond debt payments. Uh, that's the continuation of, of the projects, uh, the, the annual debt service for the projects uh, that uh, Center of Excellence projects that are funded out of revenue bonds uh, and include some lease purchase and uh, debt service for uh, the possibility of issuing COPS. I, I will point out that the budget has some capacity in it to issue debt should we decide to do that going forward into the year. Um, at this point, it's not clear whether we will want to do that, but it'll be a conversation we would have uh, with the board going forward. And th what that is, and I've talked with the board about that, that's the, the idea of issuing relatively short-term debt uh, to cover some of our life cycle and facilities capital projects uh, that we that you just saw the list of, um, and then financing them over a relatively short period of time, but over a period of time that takes the, the cost of it outside of expenditure limitations. So the budget has the capability to handle doing that. Uh, the board, it would require board action and, and uh, we'll keep the board posted in the coming months. Uh, part of that is a little bit contingent on uh, expenditure limitation and, and work that we're doing at the state level to try and get some relief from the state. So it has flexibility in it. Um, I've mentioned a couple of the COVID related impacts already. Um, and in terms of, you know, one of the biggest challenges is the enrollment uncertainty. Uh, really with unprecedented unemployment, uh, historically, we would be thinking that our enrollment would in increase, um, that, that community colleges are countercyclical to the economy, so that when, uh, when uh, jobs are hard to find uh, or people lose their jobs, they often look to community colleges for retraining or for uh, education when there's, when there's not the opportunity to get a job. Um, it's unclear whether this particular economic cycle will re will result in that way, uh, in that kind of a, a result. Um, and uh, so, you know, really, we've got to have a budget that has the ability to grow, but also one that we have some plans for how we would shrink it uh, should enrollment go the other direction. Um, and I also alluded to the fact that there are major changes happening in the higher education landscape. Um, and uh, again, Lisa talked about them, uh, Lee's talked about them, uh, and Ian talked about them earlier, uh, that uh, really that uh, there are major changes in terms of what student expectations are going to be, uh, what student behaviors are going to be in terms of higher education, um, what, what the implications are for residential institutions uh, is, is really going to be something that we'll have to see as, as time goes on. Um, and uh, uh, fortunately, we're in a, a place where we have relative stability, um, and, uh, but it's why you're seeing and hearing uh, really significant results from, from colleges and universities that are reliant on residential auxiliary uh, room and board uh, revenue uh, and or uh, uh, re uh, reliant on out-of-state and international and or really high tuition that those are the institutions that are uh, really facing a dire future, uh, at least immediate or short term. Um, and then also those institutions that are reliant on state aid are going to be under a lot of pressure as those revenue sources are drying up and the states are gonna have to deal with budget crises. Uh, fortunately, neither of those are our principal or primary revenue sources. So we're in good shape in terms of that. Um, we have talked with the board about some of the revenue losses that we are expecting. Uh, sales tax revenue in the state has dropped dramatically and we're expecting that, th that while it may pick up in the second half of the year, it's gonna take some time before it picks back up. Uh, and we've folded that into the budget. Our investment earnings are going to be uh, lower than what we've talked about. We will be affected by international tuition, but it's a relatively small uh, part of our total budget. Um, and then that gets us to the last bullet on this page, which is uh, those revenue sources and streams that we're looking at that, that we're expecting reductions in short and midterm um, all have adverse effects on our expenditure limitation. And it's why we've talked with the board about expenditure limitation, working with the state to get relief 
um, and then coming up with other strategies for it. Um, uh, and I uh, don't want to belabor that point, but but uh, we've talked a, a number of times with the board specifically about what the longer term implications of expenditure limitation are and then what the in immediate impacts from COVID have been uh, and, and how we hope to uh, address those issues. Okay, so uh, as I've mentioned that adopting the budget is establishing the maximum spending capacity for the fiscal year. Uh, we have reserves uh, that so can support new or changing priorities. We have strategic initiatives funds uh, set aside each year so that as things, high priority items come up, we can move quickly in terms of investing in those uh, new ideas or those new critical needs um, and we can meet the enrollment demand. Um, and then again, as I've mentioned, uh, we're not required to spend up to our limits and uh, there are going to be some important elements. And when we get into the details, I'll show you a couple of examples where uh, we are very much expecting to spend less than what the budget is, uh, that the budget is there just uh, in case we have to grow uh, for enrollment purposes. Dr. B, could you tell okay. us if we yep. were, if you, if we were to, uh, if we were to direct an, uh, a um, enrollment revitalization fund 2.0 this year because of what's going on and we were to direct uh, additional resources into marketing in particular and some of these other mm -hmm. things that we were successful. Um, is there, is fund, are funds built into the budget that would allow that or would we need to add that? Yeah, we have the spending capacity to do that. The big problem is the expenditure limitation component of that. So what happens is we have the budget and the finances to be able to do those things. But when the year, when we finish up the year and we have, uh, have to report to the state, how did we do in terms of our expenditure limit? Uh, we will uh, basically be looking like we overspent our expenditure limitation. Well, except uh, for again, the, that's why we're, but look, except for these, I mean, the revitalization funds, we were able to get around that because they were one time initiatives that were, you know, based on the fiscal year and we, we used the carry forward, which you've advised us not to do on a regular basis, but again, these are pretty extraordinary times. So if we were to use a carry forward again from the expenditure limit and we were to create a revitalization fund 2.0, um, then again, it would, it would all be based on, you know, what work, not continuing programs or creating new positions. It would be these one-time funding resources. So you're saying we have yeah, to, do uh, to do that or would we need to yeah, add to the current budget? Uh, we have, we have the revenues and the budget capacity too. The problem, and, and I'll clarify a little bit, the expenditure limitation issue. So recall that last year we had, we were finishing up the three year uh, plan to reduce our expenditure limitation to meet the fiscal year 21 level. So uh, our expenditure limit for the last few years has been uh, somewhere between 100 million and 101 million. So in, in that realm. Uh, and the fiscal year 21 expenditure limitation level was going to drop down to 87 million. So we were gradually were reducing it, those $5 million uh, of reduction each year. The goal was in fiscal year 20 to get us to about that 87, $88 million level, and which we did. Um, the problem then is that that worked last year, which is that, okay, we still in fiscal year 20 had an expenditure limit that was 101 million. And we had expected, you know, our budget was really based on something closer to $88 million. And so when we added the one-time funding, it was, okay, well, let's do this for one time. We'll add about $5 million of additional expenses because we have more than that in extra capacity in fiscal year 20. And it's why we also said this has to be one-time stuff. It has, it has to be stuff right. that we can turn off because now we're coming into the fiscal year 21 reality. Now, to answer the second part of the question, which is, uh, how would we spend the money or what will happen is that if we go over our expenditure limit number in, in our, our limit, which is around $87 million in fiscal year 21, um, it will be uh, one, we're hoping to not because we're hoping to get relief. Uh, so uh, that's why it's really important to go to the state and at least uh, for the short term, get that crisis relief of 
that there would be no penalty for going over expenditure limitation, in which case we would go over, but the only penalty that we would incur was it would be something like we, uh, we have a fine of $100 or something like that, which is what's happened in the past, and that's what we're, we're pitching. Um, that, uh, so if that's the case, then we go over and there's no major consequence to it. The other things that we're looking to do um, would be that we do have carry forward accumulated. So that's over the, over the years where we didn't spend up to our, our expenditure limit and we carried forward reserve money. Uh, essentially, like the simplest way to think about it is we had tuition money that came in and we didn't we didn't use that. We didn't have to use the tuition money for, that was excludable. So we carry that forward in fund balance and we have some amount that we can use. So what we would what would actually happen if we overspent our expenditure limit amount would be that we would be using carry forward money um, mm -hmm. and that that there's a limit to how how long we can do that. And with the amount that we're talking about, because of the covid related impacts, those revenue reductions, we're already on the wrong side of expenditure limitation with this budget. Um, that, which is why, again, the relief becomes really important and the idea of COPS become another solution, um, but that uh, we're already looking to be over our expenditure limit because the budget has changed on us and because we, we lost those excludable revenues. Um, so that if we decide to add additional money, it's just going to make that expenditure limit number worse. Sorry for the long answer, but that's how it plays out. And it's not great news, for sure. Any other questions on that before I move on? Um, okay, so uh, one of the things that uh, we wanted to show you is that uh, as we're talking about this capacity document and we're looking at scenarios which might have significant enrollment reductions uh, or, or declines, uh, how would the college respond to that? And And the answer is, uh, so this slide basically in a very high level summarizes what kind of an impact we would be looking at. And so if there was a 15% reduction in FTSE, um, starting from a point where we're, we're around 14,000 right now, um, we would lose roughly $5 million in tuition revenue. Um, that because of the way that our classroom funding model works, that uh, that we would be offering quite a few, uh, quite a uh, significantly fewer sections, uh, and that's what academic efficiencies would be. So there would be fewer sections offered uh, if we stayed in this, the current way that there, the classroom face-to-face uh, -face is supposed to be 20 to 1, uh, online is 25 to 1 on average, uh, that, uh, the fewer, that, that that kind of an enrollment decline would naturally result in reduced number of sections that would save about $2.8 million. Um, we're talking about a soft freeze right now and then position closures. So we have more than 60 vacant positions right now, many, some of which are in recruitment, um, but that one of the things that we're looking to do is do a, a soft freeze on recruitments or on, on filling vacancies that we are only filling absolutely critical positions at this point. Um, and that we're looking with those vacancies to close as many of them as possible. They're closing this uh, number that's about $2 million is closing 30 positions, um, which from my standpoint, I think is pretty doable, particularly in light of if enrollment declines uh, that we can uh, certainly would justify and would would need to do that kind of a reduction. Um, and then operational reductions just to round it out um, in the short term of $340,000 is uh, if you spread that between departments or you looked at the fact that our travel is going to be down this year because uh, we have pretty we have restricted travel right now and it's unlikely that it's gonna be uh, lifted uh, in, in terms of going back to a normal status for most of the year uh, and other offer operational savings that we'll have during the year. Uh, saving another $300,000 would not be difficult to do. So that's how in the short term we would handle that kind of a reduction. Um, and then uh, the secondary component yeah, can is I, can that I, can if... Can I ask yep. a question on that? Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So um, academic efficiencies, 2.8 million. So if that's reducing sections, et cetera, I get that, but, but is it the main cost of sections, the personnel to teach them? 
Yeah, well, that's what the reductions would be, that we would not need to have as many adjunct faculty contracts. And that's what the savings comes from, is that you don't have as many adjunct that's, faculty contracts. I'll make sure everybody knows that means that's fewer adjunct faculty teaching. Okay. Yeah, sorry that I, I put that in coded where it's, but yes, it's, that's, it's what, that's what that It's personnel people. It's people. Okay. Yes. Yes, it would it would definitely be fewer contracts for adjunct faculty initially. That's this that's the way the structure would work. Um, and then down at the bottom, um, the 50 to one ratio, what that means is that in the future. So when you're talking about a 15 percent FTSE reduction, you're talking about 2000 full time student equivalents that would be uh, dropping. <clears throat> and that the way that the uh, faculty model works in terms of targeting that 50 to 1 ratio, which, by the way, I will also point out that we have never quite attained that since we've been implementing it. We're always a little bit behind. But the implications are that if we dropped 20, uh, 2,000 FTSE and you have a 50 to 1 ratio, that's 40 full-time equivalent faculty positions. And that translates into the $2.4 million. Now, that wouldn't happen until the next year, um, and that then happens uh, almost almost always uh, that 50 to 1 ratio process uh, happens through attrition. But when you're talking about that big of a reduction, uh, it's unlikely that there, there would be that many vacant positions on the faculty side. So just so you know, that's how the different models play in um, that sort of ensure that the college has ways to adapt to declines in enrollment. And conversely, if enrollment goes up, that 50 to 1 ratio would would naturally then uh, the next year would build back in uh, full time faculty positions. Dave, did you say? So Dave, how does that how does that Dave? ratio affect our uh, how does that ratio affect our uh, HLC uh, high, high learning actually, evaluations? It 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 actually uh, works pretty well for that. Uh, years ago, the college was criticized. Uh, this is back in two thousand ten, I believe. Um, that one of the comments from the HLC was that uh, we didn't have a clear process for what the ratio of adjunct to full-time faculty was. And back then, uh, what happened was um, we had budget, uh, budget pressure from the state. The state was reducing our, our budget. Um, we had other financial challenges from the fiscal crisis. But at that point, we had enrollment increases. And so what happened is uh, the college uh, addressed that by adding more adjunct faculty uh, taught sections. And the ratio of adjunct to full time uh, got more weighted to the adjunct side. Um, and the college didn't really have a process. It's actually the big complaint from the HLC is that the college didn't have a particular ratio that it was targeting. Um, and so they they pointed that out as a criticism. What the 50 to 1 ratio does is actually holds that fairly steady because as our enrollment goes down, we retain the same ratio of full time faculty, which conversely, because the, they both inversely wake, work off of each other. It Got means it. that the adjunct ratio also stays stable. Yeah. Uh, so it actually has right. a twofold. It, it works in a twofold way. It's actually it, it's pretty uh, helpful from both on both from both standpoints. Okay, Great question. You. Um, uh, this slide, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. So I believe we have two questions, one from Mr. Hanna and one from Ms. Garcia. Ms. Garcia, if you want to go first. Ms. Garcia? Okay, Mr. Hanna. Sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I have a question. The question is, what amount of... My understanding is was the international students, the college was gaining 500,000, half a million dollars in revenues. So has that, has that been taken into consideration in doing and in, in presenting this budget? The, uh, the lost revenue is factored in. Uh, the what what the long term implications are of our international program uh, are not folded into the budget. So we're continuing to operate on a staffing level uh, as we have been. Uh, that is one of the things that that if this continues and if there, it looks like a continuing element that that's a relative cost center so that we will uh, start looking at that program and, and identifying how to reduce costs in terms of the administrative costs associated with that program. But there aren't staff reductions built into this budget as it is right now. 
Um, okay. But the tuition loss is built in. Okay, thank you. Dave, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. So uh, with a 15% drop in enrollment, you said that it equated to 40, 40 uh, full-time faculty members? Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, a 15% reduction is gigantic. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hopefully we won't experience anything like that. Uh, you know, again, I think that there are reasons that we can be optimistic or hopeful that we'll actually be on the on the other end of the of the higher education recalibration. Um, that, that there are lots of reasons why we are the we are the value uh, the value proposition for for sure. Um, we have everything to offer in terms of workforce retraining uh, and all the initiatives that we have underway, like what Ian showed on the the Google program that all of the, the quick retraining programs uh, to address the, the the folks who might be unemployed for a shorter period of time, um, but also the affordability proposition that those who, who uh, you know, at least I mentioned the notion that, that we're starting to hear students say, you know, I don't want to pay uh, full tuition, uh, private school tuition or, or out of state tuition to get online education. Um, we are, uh, you know, on the, we're the cost leaders when it comes to those, that proposition. And we just have to, you know, hopefully we will take advantage of that. Um, and I think that there are reasons to be hopeful. The problem I'm worried about is that we are seeing behavioral changes that are pretty dramatic in terms of the COVID response. This isn't a normal economic downturn. Uh, people are, you know, I think they don't know when it, the uncertainty of when it's going to end, the uncertainty of when their economic circumstances might improve, the, the sheer significance and size of the economic impacts to people individually. Um, you know, when it comes down to uh, whether you have food and shelter, you start realizing that higher education is discretionary. Um, unfortunately, I mean, and we've got to, I think, continue to, to make the case that it's an investment into the future. And certainly with our tuition and with folks who are Pell eligible, uh, that, that the Pell money pays for more than just the tuition and fees at the college. Um, however, we, we obviously do have a situation where, where people are worried about any money for food. Um, the, and when they're that uncertain, I think that it's, it's concerning that, or, or to think that they're going to turn around and go, okay, I'm going to go invest in education is something that we've got to try and, and coach people into that decision. And that's something that I worry about, right? I mean, personally, I'm worried about that kind of that, that severity and, and how I think afraid people are in spending money right now. Uh, might lead to our to an enrollment decline, and hopefully that won't be the case. So, so I, let me uh, add something to what you were saying, Maria. So, one of the commitments that we're making as a college to our existing employees is to reskill and upskill them from a current position they are in to one that we know we need to have this position going forward. So, can we do that as opposed to having to lay somebody off? So this is why it becomes important when you talk about those 60 positions and, and 30 of them, we, we would not eliminate uh, and try to upskill and reskill people into them. So that's one important piece to keep in mind. When you talk about international, many of those employees actually have the skills to do the work of academic advisors and other levels of work. So, so that actually gives us an opportunity to not have to impact them individually, but to redeploy them in other parts of the college so that when things do improve over time, we can fold them back into that unit. So that way we can continue to offer those uh, experiences and options for our students. So the nice thing is we're in a position to have some of that flexibility built into what you're seeing. But my, my first commitment is to our existing employees uh, provided that they're willing to be upskilled and reskilled, uh, that we can take care of them first before we introduce too many new employees. Now, obviously, you can't do this for every job. Uh, it's not always feasible. For example, if we lost a nurse uh, faculty, unless someone is a licensed nurse internally in another job, uh, uh, it's not likely we can upskill and reskill them into that position. So there's some balancing that has to happen 
as part of this. Okay, and I'll shoot through the next few slides pretty quickly, and then I'm going to hit a couple of things that uh, from the de some of some of the detail slides that that addresses some some of the questions that that I'm sure that you have and that came up earlier in the meeting today. Um, getting back to the property tax, um, the the decision to go levy neutral um, is, is essentially versus what we were looking at. It forego we forego about four two point four million dollars. And if you uh, look at what the, the tax rate, because of the growth in assessment valuation and the growth in new property, uh, the tax rate will actually go down. Uh, so people whose property valuation stayed relatively flat will actually see a reduction in that scenario. Um, on average, what it means is it stays flat, but there will definitely be people who experience uh, some uh, a, a real reduction in terms of how much they're contributing to the college. Uh, it still does generate $122 million uh, for the college, and it's an increase of about $2 million. I'm going to skip through. That just shows you how things have changed in terms of the use of, of different funds. Uh, the big increase the last couple of years in terms of the blue, uh, that could be worrisome, except for uh, this is all because we issued the bonds and that we're uh, now doing the construction projects. So we have the capacity built in to do those large construction pro projects um, and to uh, have those big expenditures. So we have to build that capacity into the budget so that you can uh, actually spend the money uh, as those contracts and, and those projects come to fruition. Ms. Doctor, um, I believe Meredith Hay has yep. a question and she had to, uh, she yep. had an internet issue, so she called in and I believe we've upgraded her now. So Dr. Hay, are you able to ask? I just wanted to double check that I, I had a uh, voice activation. You could hear me, so I'm fine, thank you. Perfect, so everybody's back on the call. Okay, Dr. Yep, B. Thank you. Bye. Mr. Sorry, Hanna, Dr. Have, B. Uh, Mr. Hanna, you have a question now? Yeah, on, on the uh, property valuation. So, Dr. B, there's no concern that this uh, upcoming or the recession that, or depression that we're going to be in is going to have a downward effect on value, uh, property valuation? Okay, uh, a couple things. Uh, that, that property valuations will, in my opinion, they're going to go down. It usually, it takes a while for that process to trickle through. So I, I would say in a couple of years, the valuations will go down. Um, but remember that what our authorization is, is to uh, levy a flat, a, a flat dollar amount. And so if valuations go down, the tax rates go up and they counterbalance each other. Um, now, the worry, the one that, that I'm watching, is that the issue and the potential of people to default on their property tax, uh, on their property taxes. Um, we are uh, in touch with the county on a, uh, at least weekly right now uh, because the May property taxes just came due and we're trying to make sure that, that there isn't a lag in terms of people paying their taxes late or not paying them. Um, and so far, uh, there's actually just a very small, uh, small reduction in terms of what their receipts are year over year. Um, it's, it's hard even at this point to say if, if it's, if it's noticeable. Um, that the other thing to understand about property taxes is it's a liability that stays on the property so that if the property um, is purchased through debt, uh, that mortgage insurance and the banks ultimately will also be responsible for the property tax payments. And so even in the fiscal crisis, when you had all of those foreclosures happening, that the college, uh, the, the college in a given year, uh, I think the worst year we had was, I, I think we had property tax receipts that were 97% of what we were expecting. And then what happens is it's just a lag the next year they come back in. Okay, so generally speaking, there it's a very stable revenue source. Um, it is, and it's not dependent on the value of the property, it's dependent on the, 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 the we're uh, enabled to levy a dollar amount. The thing that I'm worried about is that we're in a new economic world. This is not like anything we've seen before. And if the economy is is so bad that defaults happen widespread, um, again, this is sort of a catastrophic scenario. 
uh, then what we might see is in October, November, that our property tax receipts will be slower and or they come in a lot lower than what we're expecting. Again, we won't know that until October. The good news is, is that this year looks solid, um, and I think that we'll get in essentially what we're expecting. Um, what will become important is what does the economy look like in the fall? Uh, but we'll see bigger indicators before we see the property tax scenario. We'll know other things. We'll start seeing other things in terms of how is the economy being affected, what's happening with people, and and uh, um, are they losing their houses and that sort of thing? And then we'll be able to project whether that's going to have an effect on us. But again, that would be a very dire circumstance for us to have uh, a real impact on our, a real negative impact on our property tax levy. Uh, moving to this slide, it shows uh, proportionately how things have changed in terms of the uh, the different revenues uh, that receiving. Uh, note that tuition and fees are down a little bit. Again, that's related to the the reduction for international that I mentioned, uh, and then the property tax is up by two million. Those are the most significant things. The growth in college equity is just based on the projects that we're expecting to spend uh, spend down. Um, and uh, this is the fund by fund budget. Uh, the general fund budget is actually going to go down a little bit. Uh, restricted fund is going up, and that's actually one, one singular thing, which is that when we received the aviation funds from the state, because it was for a specific purpose, we took that money in and put it in the restricted fund. It is now going to be moved from the restricted fund to the capital fund, and so that's why there's a big increase in terms of the use of the, uh, of the restricted fund. And you would see that also. You'll see that in the capital fund in the details. Um, this is our proportional budget. Um, this one, when you put all funds together, uh, gets distorted because normally you say this blue section that's about you know two thirds or so is all personnel. Uh, because we have so much going on in terms of uh, building uh, buildings uh, and the capital program, uh, it now looks like a big sh a big share of the pie. Uh, if you look at the general fund, it would look a lot. It would look much more normal uh, to what we've seen in the past. Um, and then uh, talking about the communication next steps. So what we're looking to do is to get approval for this preliminary budget so that we can publish it um, in the Daily Star. Uh, that's required by statute to publish a couple times uh, and then uh, an issue a press release. And then we'll have the public hearing at the ne next board meeting, which is scheduled to be June 3rd. Uh, we are planning to have an on-site presence because the statute is written in such a way that we don't want to be um, uh, we, we don't want to run afoul of the statute, and so what we'll do is we'll set up a place that if someone wanted, wants to make public comment, that they actually do have a place to go, although we will encourage them to do it online, much like our situation is here today, where public comment can, get, can be brought into the Zoom, Zoom format. Uh, but we'll have a couple of people uh, located, uh, probably a district office, in, in case someone wants to come in and on-site make a, make a comment. Um, I, I did leave the other stuff, uh, and I wasn't planning to address it, but I know that a couple of comments and questions came up earlier. So I want to hit just a couple of uh, points in terms of the general fund expenditures. Um, and, and this is the slide that got referenced earlier in terms of the growth of administrator salaries uh, and the decline of faculty salaries. Um, one is that this is a topic that we've been talking with the board about for the last six years, if not longer, that uh, one of the things is, is that we've done a lot of administrator reductions uh, going back to, to uh, 2015 um, and uh, did a lot of reorganizations and reductions back then. Um, and carrying this forward, just to give you an idea, is that the administrator salary back in that period of time was $7, $7 million. So we've had significant reductions in the administrator line. The increase this year is actually pretty easy to explain. Um, one is that there's a 1% salary increase put in because we've talked about the salary increases. Um, the second one is that there is a position that moved from that high director level to an administrator director level. So the switching from being a director to an executive director, which is uh, you know an increase in responsibilities, crosses you over from the staff budget to the administrator budget. This is a quirk of the Pima way of looking at the budget. Um, one position is over $100,000. 
Um, and when you talk about the the change here that I'm that we're that we're highlighting is about uh, uh, 100,000 of that is just a position that moved from staff to administrator. Um, there's also an administrator position in here that we uh, that we're looking at a new uh, structure for administration that we're expecting that this is actually going to drop to. So we are consciously and constantly looking to reduce the administrative overhead uh, and and uh, try and streamline our structure. Um, and that's something that we've been we've been doing successfully since 2015, um, and we will continue to do that. Now, the reduction on the faculty side is also relatively easy to explain. 1.2 million dollars of that reduction is related to the counselor positions moving from what used to be classified as faculty to staff. So not only is there a reduction of $1.2 million here, uh, that's also what part of what is making the staff line higher. Um, in addition to that, there are about six, re uh, six reduced positions for the faculty that's related to that fact process and the 50 to one ratio, which again, I, I say it lags and it is, all, it is behind uh, where it's supposed to be, but it does include six reduced positions on the faculty side. Um, and that explains almost all of the faculty reduction. The staff increase, um, in addition to the counselor positions that I mentioned, also has the six advising positions uh, added into it and also has those one-time positions that we talked about, the dual enrollment, uh, the enhancements uh, within in a director for Pima Online. Um, and the reason that it, it has an, an increase is that behind that, we are expecting to repurpose positions. And that's where I get back to that we have these vacant positions and we need to eliminate them. Uh, at this point, they haven't been eliminated, but they will almost certainly be very soon, uh, but the budget includes the capacity for them. Um, other compensation going down is another thing that um, as we have on occasion identified that we have temporary positions that really need to be a, feg a full and regular time position, uh, full regular, regular either part-time or full-time position, that departments that identify that they have those needs can buy up a position from their temporary dollars um, and that has happened a couple of times and, and that would explain that reduction. And then the fringe, I think you're all clear on is, is uh, medical cost increases that the college is absorbing um, for, uh, and then uh, to the operational increase. And I think that's the last one that I'm gonna point out in, in specifics, and then hopefully we'll have a little discussion. Um, IT licenses, and then this is actually also where that uh, increased money is for uh, the retrofitting and the work that we need to do uh, to uh, uh, address some of the issues that we may need for uh, safe distancing uh, in some of our facilities. Uh, so those are the primary changes. That's the explanation for the changes um, in, in, almost, in almost its entirety. Um, I will also point out with faculty that uh, that the uh, last year when we did equity adjustments and we made that an administrative procedure, um, that is people who are hired in that after a year of service or after two years of service that, they're, that, that if they were hired in, they would have been hired in at a higher level. That's a procedure and that's folded into the budget in terms of we will absorb that cost and faculty who are in that situation will automatically get those increases this coming year. Okay, I think I hit a lot of the major points, unless there's some other specific things. Uh, I don't, I'm not planning to go through all the detail with you, um, but, but would like uh, to have a discussion, particularly related to uh, salaries and tuition, because I know that the, the questions have come up and, and just to make sure that, that uh, the board has opportunity to have a conversation related to those items. Thank you, Dr. B. Um, board members, are there any questions, comments at this point? Mr. Klinko? Yes, Dr. Hay. So I want to thank you, Dave, for a very thorough analysis of um, scenarios that we don't know how it's going to play out. But I'm comfortable with your worst case scenario and how you're going to manage a possible 15% reduction in the FITSEs. And so I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Mr. Hanna? So, um... So I know that this is not our real action item. The next one is our action item, but I think that in terms of uh, um, how we, we treat this reduction in, or, the, or this unknown 
in the fairest manner that we possibly can that we do need to discuss the salary increase and the tuition increase and uh, resolve whether you know, it, it appears at this point that we're favoring property owners over, over uh, students. And um, that's a little uncomfortable feeling for me, to be honest with you. But I also understand that if we, we do not raise tuition, uh, we, we discussed at our last meeting, the part of the trade-off on raising tuition was to raise uh, employee salaries. So I think we need to discuss whether we can do either of those things. And uh, I'm not sure how we go about uh, having that discussion. So, Mr. Hanna, I would say, you know, I mean, I, I don't disagree. I mean, I, I agree that this is a, again, a very unique moment. And I think, you know, we've heard from our students that they're having food insecurity, housing insecurity. Uh, I mean, they're facing some very significant challenges. Um, you know, I mean, one, one way of addressing it is that we could, you know, we could continue forward with the posted, uh, with the posted tuition increase and we could collect those funds. I mean, we've already started enrolling people have already started to enroll into the fall um, and we've already posted that tuition rate and then we actually make a decision based on where we see ourselves in the fall in terms of where enrollment actually hits um, um, if we're going to do the if we do the if we do the um, uh, salary increase or if we do a tuition rebate on that portion i mean that could be one option but i mean i thought I thought from the hypothetical 15% 50 scenario that um, we wouldn't we wouldn't need to uh, alter the increase in faculty salaries because of you'll have academic efficiency the fewer faculty. That's the concept, but this is also this is the assumption that we're at 15%. If it was 20%, we would be in a whole different. There's, I think, my biggest concern is that there's a lot of we just have no idea what to expect, and that there's a lot of uncertainty at this very moment. And so maybe it'll be maybe all of these you know worst case scenarios won't be the worst case, and it'll be you know two percent or five percent. Um, but I, I do worry that you know we are really in uncharted territory because, as Dr. B said people's behaviors are changing. It's not just, uh, I mean, people are just, I don't know, they don't, they're, they're, they're afraid for a variety of different reasons. Um, so again, I, I just, I'm just looking at what we could do that's the most, you know, that's the most, I really wanna honor, uh, I really wanna honor the commitment that we've made. I mean, I think, you know, doing those increases are, is important. I think we need to recognize that our faculty are working around the clock, but also, look at the climate. I mean, everybody, all other public sector workers are taking furloughs, they're facing layoffs now. I mean, it's, it's pretty significant. Oh, I, I get it. I get so, it. But, but, so, but, Damon, but is that, that possible? Is, is that something like that possible? It, is that something that anybody it, would? It, no, is it? So let me ask you this. Is it, is it possible though, in terms of putting, you're asking for flexibility to build in and we have to publish this on May 18th, apparently, or 26th. I mean, can you put an asterisk below it and say, if, Enrollment drops below X. So this budget will, will need to be adjusted. Or how do you do? How do you do that in, in the public press release of what you're published in the budget, the published budget? Yeah, the, the answer is because because what we're looking, what what we're actually doing in terms of the public budget, the published budget, is that it's a capacity document that you can't spend anything above X. Oh, we can go below the board, it. Right. The right. board can always give direction to go below. Um, but we, but what okay. you what you won't be able to do is say, oh, we have an enrollment increase. Can you bump up the budget and add more money for it? You wouldn't be able to do that. It's a horrible process that you just wouldn't do. Okay, so we don't so we don't need to worry about that other than as a board recognize that the unknowns are unknown, and we'll as they become as they unfold this fall, we can make we can make adjustments downward as needed. Yes, absolutely. That that is that is what I'm what I'm presenting, and that yeah, that's what I'm saying. And one other, uh, just one other thing, then Dr. B, you can hopefully verify or correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because this budget sets just the outward capacity, if there are significant um, categories inside the operational budget that later we need to adjust and move money from one fund inside that operating budget to another, 
you can do that. Uh, the, bub the, bub the budget, excuse me, that we publish doesn't pre preclude you from doing that right. four months from now or six months from now. Okay. Right. And, and right. So and, and to give like an example of that, uh, that if you look at the, 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 the pie chart that had how much is budgeted for travel, um, you know, if if we go into the year and we realize that we're going to have restricted travel beyond uh, beyond uh, what we're looking at right now, uh, that that money could be repurposed. We would have the capacity to repurpose that money uh, or we just spend less. Um, uh, right. And again, uh, then uh, you have a better financial performance at the bottom line. Do you also have cushion if we're not playing sports? Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> since okay. since uh, that generally is a cost, as as in the, a cost center right. part of the cost, yeah. um, we uh, it it actually. Uh, and, and a lot of the money, uh, so the, the costs for the program are obviously uh, sort of threefold uh, in terms of what the principal costs are. Uh, coaching salaries, which we would be continuing to have the coaches on board until something changed. Uh, the scholarships for athletes, which we would continue to do, um, uh, hoping that those programs can have those programs. What might change would be the travel costs. Um, so those are the three biggest costs in terms of athletics. Um, but we don't have a major revenue loss uh, that, that we would be suffering from like the university would. Mr. So let me just be clear on the salary increase. So this, this budget does indeed continue to have the salary increase. That's correct. And that is yep. a permanent increase. That is not a one-time increase. It is across the board salary increase. At, at this point, it's structured to be COLAs, which would be a 1% lift to the salary schedules and 1.5% to the adjunct load rate. Okay. So should we, going forward, we, we do expect, experience that 15 to 20% decrease enrollment. That salary increase is not one of the ways we would adjust. It would be reducing number of employees. Right. Is that I mean, that's, that's the scenario that, that, yeah, I mean, to, to undo a COLA would, would not be anything that would be high on the list of ways to approach this. And by the way, the way that you would say that uh, and what you've seen other organizations, and again, I don't, I don't foresee that we're going to run into this situation, but, but the other name for that in reality is actually called a furlough. I mean, that, that's what the university is doing, oh. where they're just, they're leaving people's base pay the same, but then they're essentially saving X percentage by having furloughs. By the, and a 1% furlough doesn't make a lot of sense. That'd be really small. And I think, Mark, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that 15% scenario is premised on having that many less students. And therefore, we have less demand for the sections of courses and should then also correspond to less demand for certain services of the college. So you rather adjust it based on that reality than tweaking around the edges around a percent or two in terms of salaries. We, we, we need to just account for that reduction in a very substantive way. And so the model that Dave shared really does that very well. Ms. Garcia? No, I'm going to forgo my question. Okay. Mr. Gonzalez? Okay. Okay. Are there any additional or last questions for Dr. B before we move on to our next action item? So let me just make a comment, and that is uh, I, I still am extremely uncomfortable raising tuition in, in this time period, uh, again, tied predicated on uh, rewarding or not rewarding may not be the right term, but uh, doing the right thing by our uh, employees is an important component of that. So um, I, um, so let me just say, I, I appreciate, you know, the fluidity of this whole situation 
and that we may indeed have to look at it uh, in the fall once again. But uh, uh, otherwise, I, I, I'm uh, pretty comfortable with what we've done here. So thank you, Dr. B. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next item, item 5.4, the publication of fiscal year 2021 proposed budget in preparation for the June 2020 public hearing and special board meeting to adopt the budget and set the property tax rates and levies, which we're not doing. So I'll just exclude that from the, from the agenda item. Um, do I have a motion? Uh, do, is there, Mr. Sylvan, is there a recommendation or we just take a direct motion? Uh, there is a recommendation, Mr. Chair. Could you share the recommendation with us? I would be pleased to do so. The Chancellor recommends that the Governing Board approve publication in accordance with statutory requirements of the fiscal year 2021 budget in the Arizona Daily Star on May 18, 2020 and May 26, 2020, and conduct a public hearing and a special board meeting on June 3, 2020 for the purpose of adopting the budget and setting property tax rates and levies. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? So move. Okay, I think I heard that from Dr. Hay, and I think I heard a second potentially from Maria Garcia. Was that a second? Second. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the item? Okay, hearing none. Mr. Sullivan, if you could do a roll call vote, please. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Klinko? Yes. Mr. Hanna? Yes. Dr. Hay? Yes. Ms. Garcia? Yes. Mr. Gonzalez? Hmm. Mr. Gonzalez, are you still with us? Uh, Mr. Chair, I was just scrolling through the list of attendees that I can see, and he does not appear to be there anymore. Okay. So um, for the record, we have a four, uh, four votes. So it's the, the four members attending uh, would approve it. And uh, the one member who has um, left the meeting is abstaining. So um, with that, the motion carries. The next item is the tuition rate for students employed by businesses participating in the tuition reimbursement assistance program. Mr. Sylvan, will you begin by reading the recommendation? Certainly, Mr. Chair. The Chancellor rec recommends the Governing Board adjust non-resident tuition for online courses for non-Arizona residents employed by a business with a presence in Pima County that is participating in the college's tuition reimbursement assistance program. The adjustment would align the tuition rate for students participating in the program with the current in-state tuition rate effective for the fall 2020 term. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? So moved. So moved. Mr. Hanna, is there a second? Second. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hay? Uh, discussion? Yes, please. Yes. Mr. Lambert. And then I've also, um, yeah, if, yes. if we could just check to make sure that uh, Mr. Gonzalez didn't call back into the number and needs to be upgraded. Uh, into the uh, into the platform. Okay, Mr. Lambert. So uh, we're we're so excited about the work that we've been doing over the last few years to really strengthen our partnerships with area businesses. As you know, we have a number of businesses in the community who also have presence in a lot of different locations within the state, as well as locations outside of the state and globally. But this is really allowing us to do because of the partnerships we built here, not only offer uh, the in-state online rate for the folks who are here, but also to extend that to their entire uh, employee base, regardless of where they are. And that's what this is about. And it really allows us to uh, attract additional uh, opportunities for individuals to be Pima Community College students by extending our reach through our partnerships. Uh, If you'd like to hear more about the details of how the program works, I'd be glad to have even, either David or Ian address those pieces. Are there any additional questions? No? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Sylvan, if you could uh, do a roll call vote. Please. Wait a minute, hold oh, on. Yeah. Ms. Garcia. 
Okay, so I have a question. So how does that relate to, I understand that these are uh, legal residents and perhaps from another state, but how does that relate to the undocumented students? Because if they're not able to get, uh, a, you know, pay in-state residency, doesn't that, doesn't that create a conflict? Do you understand my question? Chancellor Lambert? <laughs> well, I, I think part of the issue lies in the, the way the law is constructed. Uh, the college is um, prohibited of being able to offer in-state tuition rates to uh, DACA students. Um, and I think that is probably the, the main difference. I don't know if Jeff, if you want to add on to that. Um, well, let me, I guess, offer a little bit and then, then maybe we can see whether we're addressing uh, Ms. Garcia's question or not. And before you do, Mr. Silva, maybe I could just ask a question. Doesn't this, isn't this only for, this is really specifically for the employees of businesses that are of that organization. bringing to an exactly. agreement with the college. Right, that that's correct. Working. Right, so the individuals who could participate are employees who work for an employer who has a location in Pima County, also has locations in other venues and is uh, providing tuition reimbursement assistance to its employees as an employee benefit. So this is really only for the employees of businesses that have a location in Pima County and are contracting with the college to provide educational resources, but they can open it to their full employee base, which may be outside of Pima County. Right, so the idea is that Pima Community College would be the educator of choice for the entire business, not just their Pima County location. So if so, it's really only for the employees of, the, of those businesses. That's correct, correct. that's correct. Okay. So I'm okay with that answer. Okay. So hearing no additional questions, uh, if we could have a roll call. Uh, Mr. Klinko. Yes. Mr. Hanna. Yes. Dr. Hay. Yes. Ms. Garcia. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, do we have you back? Okay. So the motion passes uh, with four members voting yes and Mr. Gonzalez abstaining because he has left the meeting and has not called back as of yet. Um, if he calls back, we will upgrade him. We're watching for the, we're watching for his return. Okay, the last item on our agenda is 5.6, the participation agreement, yellow ribbon GI education enhancement program. Mr. Silvan, if you could please read the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The chancellor recommends the governing board authorize the chancellor or designee to enter a participation agreement for the yellow ribbon GI education enhancement program. The program creates a cost sharing mechanism between the college and the United States Department of Veteran Affairs to reduce non-resident tuition expenses for enrolled students. Do I have a motion to approve the recommendation? I'll go ahead. And okay. <laughs> and, uh, Ms. Hay, well, I will second it then. So I have Ms. Hay making the motion and, uh, and I will second it. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, let's have a roll call vote. Mr. Sylvan? Mr. Klinko? Yes. Mr. Hanna? Yes. Dr. Hay? Yes. Ms. Garcia? Yes. <laughs> I know. Thought we lost you there for a minute. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Okay. The motion passes uh, with four members voting yes and one member absent. Um, uh, item number six is our request for future agenda items. Are there any future agenda items that people would like to uh, have, uh, Mr. Hanna? Yeah. Uh, two things. One, uh, before I get to future agenda items, I would just like a opinion from our uh, legal counsel that if Mr. Uh, uh, Gonzalez was cut off for some technical reason, that he'd be able to, at the next meeting, be able to express how he would have voted on uh, on those. Not that it will change, it won't change the, the outcome, but 
then we make a provision for him to be able to do that. And then in terms of future items, an item that we have not uh, addressed in, or the board has not taken a look at in some time. So either in a study session or as an agenda item, I would like us to review our progress on our diversity plan. Okay. Okay. Are there any others? Okay. Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned. And thank you everybody thank for you. Thank you all. all it takes to put it together in this uh, unique modality. So thank you, especially <laughs> thank you, to Damian. our Good IT. Good job, Damien. Bye-bye. See you at the retreat Bye. on Friday. See you at the retreat. Okay. <laughs> See you. Okay. Bye. All right. Thanks, y'all. Night.